All right, all right. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Metaverse Nomads podcast, where we talk about all things metaverse related, blockchain gaming, NFTs, and all things associated around the metaverse as a whole. I'm Jesse, also known as Whitticus, and I'm here with some of the usual suspects. Uh, we've uh, let's go back around a little bit. We've got um, Ray up in the top corner there. Ray, how you doing? I'm doing great. I got my dark chocolate, eighty five percent, with a nice glass of water. I'm ready for the show. Cacao, nice. Cacao. <laughs> <laughs> nice how show. about you, Banjo? How's it going, man? I am doing well. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. And it's time for some libations. Nice, nice. How about you, Fancy Ad? How's it going? Uh, looking forward to having our guests here this week. It's going to be a great episode. It is going to be a great episode. So with that, we do have a special guest this week. We've got uh, two folks joining us from the Metaverse Mining Alliance, also known as MMA. Uh, we've got uh, Casper and we've got Dark Swoop. Now, it's exciting to have them on. Uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, set up to what's led up to this at this point, because this is a group that we have been speaking with for quite some time now. It's going back uh, uh, quite, a, quite a ways. And I think before they were on anyone's radar, really, they were doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes without any hype. And I think they were doing a lot of things right and a lot of things that we as a guild with Rome can learn from. And for that reason, we have been uh, going down that path of exploring uh, not only what an alliance looks like, but a partnership as well. And details will be forthcoming more about that in the future. But it should stand on its own to say that uh, if you've heard any of our shows in the past, uh, that's something that we take quite serious, which is why we haven't had any announcements to that effect in the past prior to this. So with that, um, Dark Swoop and Casper, welcome to the show. Hey there. Great to be here. Um, first off, I want to start and say like we're, we're actually all on the team, big fans of the show. So really looking forward to uh, you know working together in the future and, and excited to, to chat across a number of topics tonight. Nice. Yeah, it's really nice to be able to join you guys. Um, we've had some fantastic discussions offline before, and I think it's really great that we've got the opportunity to discuss that now with you guys here and everyone in the comments and in the community in the future. It's a really great opportunity. Thank you very much. So one of the things I think that makes this show special and the way that we wanted to approach it is that so many of you that are uh, listening to this, whether you're listening to it live or whether you're going to uh, listen to whether you're listening to a replay, is that we week to week, we do a lot of theory crafting. We talk about a lot of the different games we're involved in. For the most part, that covers a lot of Star Atlas. In the past, we've talked a bit about Mirandus and some of the other projects with Gala Games. Uh, we've talked about Axie Infinity, about Alluvium, DeFi Kingdoms. Uh, we've kind of covered some of the projects that are closest to us. There's a lot going on as the metaverse unfolds. But one of the things that's quite interesting is that most of the people that are participating in the play to earn side of blockchain games and you know metaverse gaming are somewhat crypto savvy. So in the past, a lot of uh, a lot of us collectively have been uh, looking at different crypto projects. But now that games have opened up, it's uh, for those of us that have been passionate about games in the past. It's kind of a way to bring our passion into the mix as we can start earning. The thing that comes up that's interesting is that a lot of times it's speculation where we really don't understand much about the business of play to earn gaming. And the truth is it's a new business to some degree, but I think there's a lot of value in learning from those that have expertise in other industries that are now looking at this industry to say, hey, how can we bring tried and true business principles uh, to this space? And so that's one of the reasons that we have found a lot of value in the relationship that we have uh, with MMA is because these guys do come from a background of having experience in, in finance and are bringing that experience to the blockchain space. So what does that mean for you as someone listening to the show? Well, it may lend for, uh, towards you having a better idea of things to think about as it relates to building a business in this space, whether that is just you as an individual that's participating in, in play to earn gaming, whether that's you as someone that's thinking about forming a guild, whether you have a guild or maybe in what to look for in a guild. So all the conversations uh, that we want to have on the show with MMA surround the business of play to earn gaming. So 
I think with that, probably a good place to start with you guys, uh, whichever wants to go first, tell us a little bit about who you are and your background and how you found your way into this space. Sure, um, I can I can take that one. Uh, basically, um, you know, our, our genesis really, like a lot of people involved in play to earn, is coming from Axie Infinity. Um, we're we're a group of a group of co-founders um, who, who have basically come from either Axie Infinity side or from the DeFi side of things. So we've we've kind of realized quite quickly that those are those are complementary experiences. And I, I think that what we've got with, within our team that we're going to talk about is, is really a truly integrated uh, approach where, you know, people with different skills are, are all kind of supporting each other and, and really compounding the strengths. Um, I, I think we'll go through the, these ideas a, a bit more, but, you know, ev everybody can can learn from each other. And, you know, when it comes to decision making in, in, a, in a place like play to earn where things move quickly and it's a dynamic environment uh, you want to be essentially inputting as many pieces of information uh in, into the decisions you're making absolutely yeah so, yeah, so we're, we're a, a multi-game multi-chain guild um you know that has uh has challenges and has advantages on the, on the challenges side it means you know tooling we might have built by our development team isn't one size fits all where you've got different blockchains um but on on the plus side and, and we we really see this as, as a strong plus um you have this kind of inbuilt diversification you're not reliant on the performance or the sustainability of just one game um so i i think that's where uh, a lot of people have kind of realized that with what's happened in the axie economy recently is that if you are too wedded and too exposed to one game um you can kind of have everything riding on that uh so i think what we'll see going forward is is a lot more small and medium-sized guilds actually trying to to spread themselves across a couple of games and and i think that leads into to some discussion about how they do that about uh which games are appropriate and, and what it means for them so so I, no i was just, i was that's that's exactly the the type of conversations we're going to be having as the show goes on. But um, from a financials uh, background, could you elaborate on um, MMA and its team uh, on the financial end of like yeah, the sure. experience? Yeah, yep. like along the lines of like where did you guys come from and like why yeah. this case? How did you find yourselves here? What did, what drew you here? Yeah, it, it's interesting. So um, we were all part of a DeFi community that was looking at the opportunities in, in that space. Mm. And one of the co-founders was operating and had built from the ground up an Axie Guild. Uh, so, so we started chatting and, and connecting actually around the launch of the Star Atlas posters. Uh, nice. so, so it was there that the kind of the worlds collided a little bit and we started throwing around these ideas of, you know, actually these kind of financial engineering techniques and, and the things we're doing in DeFi are quite applicable in the P2E space. Uh, so it's from there that, that we, we kind of morphed into MMA, the, this guild operation, but, but really, as, as we like to call it, guild as a business, where it's not just purely p play a game, you know, earn some in-game currency, convert it into USD, pay your scholars at some point, which is probably V1.0 of a gaming guild. Uh, it, it's a lot more than that. It's about thinking about, okay, what, what are the asset flows after that? And, and how can you improve the margins for the business and, and the scholars, as well as taking out a lot of the, the kind of um, the, the inbuilt risks. So you may not realize it, but when you're involved in the P2E space, um, you end up becoming a bit of a passive speculator, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, like I've mentioned before, and, and, and we really want to see, okay, how, how can we get rid of that? And, and it's something everybody in the space should be starting to think about a little bit. Yeah, it's something that you guys will all be really like quite familiar with. I started with Axie about seven or eight months ago, and it was a very one-dimensional process. You play, 
every two weeks you get your SOP, you check how much it is on CoinGecko or something, and that's how much you get. Your managers get a share, you get a share, that's that. And you're just sort of like Casper said, spectating, and you're just going through the motions, really. And it's only through the time of us coming together and developing MMA, we realized it can be a lot more than that. There's a lot more like moving parts uh, in play, and you can really actually maximize that opportunity. And we're going to obviously elaborate on that later. But it's interesting to reflect back to where P2E was, say, a year or six months ago. Because I don't know how you guys felt about it, but for me, it was it's a completely different landscape or the way that we're approaching it. Mm -hmm. It's really come yeah. a long way in a short period of time. For sure. A lot of projects are adopting uh, what the trailblazers of their time, like CyberKongs and Axie, with the to two-token model, governance utility, and then just holding and earning yield off of an NFT profile picture. So a lot of the things that people are coming into the space now are loving and reaping the rewards from are, are from... It started from one place and, and a couple of people with ideas and implementing them. So th there's more of that where that came from. Yeah, I think it kind of equates to the the Wild West is kind of what how the industry has been. And it, it occurs to me that you guys are bringing in some of the industrial revolution tools into the West to kind of set up shop. That's I mean, that's what inspires me most about what I see you guys doing. Yeah, th this is it. And, and there's a lot of commentators who say like that the whole of crypto is just basically reliving uh, financial history, kind of rediscovering all these different instruments and, and cycles and, and what works and what doesn't. Um, so, so totally, totally agree with that. And, and that's what we're trying to accelerate here. You know, there's a lot of analogous situations um, in play to earn to the real world where solutions ha have already been derived for you know for example you know the farmer who is farming corn and doesn't want to be exposed to the price of corn every mm -hmm. time every few months when his crop is done you know he needs to know how many dollars he can take home to fix his tractor or to, to you know to to buy the next bunch of seeds uh you, you know you can see how that's similar to somebody earning or yielding within a game and, and also having exposure to the value of what they're yielding. Um, so, you know, there are institutions that solve these problems in the real life right. and we can, we can borrow what's already been built and, and, you know, coming back to the team, we've got team members from the commodities world. We've got team members from the investment banking world who have kind of seen these things in real life on a much larger scale and, and how to really leverage them to help businesses um be more sustainable and to thrive yeah and, and you bring up go ahead ben. go ahead ray <laughs> okay you bring sorry thank you so casper you you bring up something um that i'm familiar with and, and is kind of something that i'm a, a hobbyist at, at least um, and that's the idea of a futures market when you're describing commodities do you see a place for that in a, in a play to e metaverse yes totally um and actually it's probably one of the levers that um, that the, the games can start to use themselves in terms of balancing the economy a bit, because because when you have these tokens available and financial instruments available, um, you, you kind of allow people to to do things they couldn't do before, right? You know, if you've got more people playing the game sustainably, that that's going to be better for your game. Um, you know, it, it's not a kind of uh, one bullet solution, but it's definitely a, another lever that that should be in there, along with all the other game economy related levers, you know, crafting mechanisms, burn, min, and, and, and all the other interesting stuff. Um, you know, that that's definitely one which I think is there and, and which is going to grow. Right now, the you know, is the biggest games typically that have the the most financial instruments available to help you with this kind of um, you know, revenue optimization. But um, another important thing to, to remember, and this won't be applicable to, to the vast majority of smaller and medium sized girls is, you know, in, in crypto, there's always someone who makes wants to make a bet the other way. So um, just because there isn't a financial instrument there and a market there, it doesn't mean you can't find a counterparty uh, to, to help you improve your operation. Right. 
So before we jump into too many topics related to futures and things to have some of our audience eyes glaze over, uh, interesting <laughs> to me, honestly, because it's like, for me, this is the part of gaming that I actually, I'm drawn to. In fact, I even play games that just are about resource management and about mm -hmm. futures and all that sort of thing. But uh, one of the things I think would be helpful to start with is mm -hmm. we're talking about the concept as a whole, as, as a guild, as a business. Because this is something that we have find ourselves exploring and we have not been in a hurry to, to, to make choices and, and decisions, but now we're in a place as we become more educated through assistance such as yours. Uh, let's talk about that for a moment. Like when we talk about play to earn, most people think in terms of the individual play to earn. Like most of the, we do have some people on here that are scholars, that are scholars for people within our, our guild. So we have people on both sides. We have us as, as that run a guild, We've got those that are scholars, and then we've got people that have their own assets that are, in, in this case, would be like a scholar manager. But when you guys think in terms of a guild as a business, what does that mean to you? And I see you've got a, a slide here. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, so um, I, I think this is just an expansion of, of what we were talking about, this kind of move from V1.0, which I kind of see as a guild owner effectively being an NFT renter to a small group of scholars, uh, and, and then they're going to split the revenues. What you typically see happen is that scholar pool will grow a bit, and, and with that, the structure of the scholars might have some kind of hierarchy introduced where you have managers. Um, the level of strategic training will most likely increase, so you, you can make sure that everybody is playing the game in the right way. Um, you know, and, and the, the level of info sharing, if you like, uh, for how that strategy might change over time uh, with the scholars and even the scholars feeding back if something isn't working particularly well. Uh, that's kind of the version 2.0, if you like, which I think most guilds end up structuring themselves and, and moving towards. Um, and then what I see as, as the next step, and there will be more steps in the future, I'm sure, is this fully integrated approach where, where you start to actually go from being this kind of simple operation to actually being more like a conglomerate and more, more like an all-encompassing business. Um, so here, you know, you've got this idea of a treasury. Uh, so a treasury typically it just means the place where you you manage your reserves. So if you've got a cash pile on, you know, in your business, uh, maybe you want to stick that and stake it somewhere, or, or maybe you want to just leave it in USD. Um, it, it, it's typically a standalone entity. But what we've realized is is you can do much much more when you really integrate uh, the treasury function and into. Uh, the gaming side of the business and into the R&D. So, um, you know, to talk about that a bit more, uh, asset flows, okay? So markets, if you're looking at secondary markets for, you know, ships, for example, or, or a particular axie or a particular asset, secondary markets can be signaling something about the actual game itself. Right. Uh, you know, and that's information that your scholars will want, your your kind of uh, research team would want, because it might impact uh, what you're going to buy. It might impact, you know, which teams your scholars are going to be set up with. Uh, but equally, you know, you you again, this is this is more for larger guilds as you grow. But if you're doing some kind of basic analysis or looking on chain at what's going on you might have some other large guilds tagged. If you see they're buying a certain asset, mm. a lot more than other assets, that's also going to probably tell you something about the game. So this is where that information is going to be value, valuable for scholars, but that's also going to be valuable for your treasury team who are choosing what to buy. Um, so all this stuff is all about you know what we were talking about with every bit of information from different places from people with different skill sets it is going to enhance your ability to operate as a play to earn guild. And the right. players themselves, by the way, this goes the other way. Um, you know, that line of communication of what's going on in the game can be something treasury can benefit from. Uh, I, I don't know. Are, are certain assets being burned a lot in game that the gamers can actually see? 
is that being reflected in the secondary market pricing? Um, so there's lots of kind of interesting things you can do to, to take it to the next level once you really have this kind of overall business where everyone's working together to achieve the same thing and this right. constant information flow. Um, right. Yeah, I, if, if I may, uh, not to cut your train of thought there, but a lot of the guilds that have popped up since the inception of the scholarship rave uh, and growth phase of, of uh, Axie Infinity, they don't necessarily, I haven't personally, as I consume tens, thousands, tens of thousands of hours of content, I don't see these types of conversations being had amongst the public, maybe within the personal discords themselves. But, right. you know, wealth preservation and risk management, this is all on a higher level of, of the people who created those guilds uh, usually consume themselves with. But it's just as important as we, as Rome, appeal to gamers. It, it's not something you should just forego as far as... Uh, you know, uh, your financial literacy when it comes to this new era of NFT and crypto gaming. It's right. definitely something that you would want to grow alongside with just your skills of knowledge about what game is a cool one, what, which one you only want to play. And, you know, uh, many, yeah. So I, I just think it's, this is just that other part of the pie as Rome complements MMA and MMA complements Rome in, in the ways that, you know, would, would be portrayed, maybe not in one one episode or one explanation of a, a guild as a business, but over time, as as you spend more time in the space, if you're watching out there. To, to answer Punjab's question here, who's the scholar, your guildies? So I think it can be either. Now, the, the, the thing is, is that right now with most yeah. scholarship programs, most scholarship programs are built around things that don't require a lot of collaboration. It requires an individual to function kind of like as a freelancer who then performs their tasks and so they could be a guildie, but right now, most gaming guilds, at least the way that I see it, are being built around the idea that eventually there will be reasons to collaborate in game. So as it stands now, a scholar could technically be a guildie, but right now, most of these structures are set up to where they're just kind of a freelance. Now, that also brings the interesting thing, because for me, for the past 20 years, I've, I've been a business owner and I've been a freelancer, I've been a consultant. And so one of the things that you find, and most people can associate this if you know someone that's a real estate agent, is that when you're a freelancer, there's a lot of feast and famine. And when you can be a part of something, whether it's a guild, um, what I see happening with the structure that's being built here is that the structure is starting to shave off some of the peaks and valleys so that you have more stability of income that everyone can benefit from both the scholars as well as anyone participating in the guild. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it totally does. That was a great explanation. And I, and I equip, I equal it to your day trading NFT gaming projects, <laughs> because other than having that, that shave off, like you're saying, that's going to hedge, you know, the, the potential like major losses as these projects come in, in, in and out of popularity. Is that the hamster wheel you want to live on as a guild that you just raise a lot of money on to then f to rush to get that return back from the next new popular game, but then dies out after w w yeah. these these noticeable things that we were talking about earlier, whereas the activity on the marketplace on OpenSea, for example, like Fancy Birds upcoming game, you know, I'm, I'm dropping names. We're not promoted by any of these games that we're talking about, but I personally, as an individual investor, took part in it and I check out who's buying and there's some prom the prominent guilds in the space that are buying up a bunch of fancy birds for the purposes of them bre being breedable just like your peg axie and then the or your defi hero gen zero I mean your defi kingdom gen zero and, and you can continually breed and there's a cooldown period so there's that potential printer go burr uh type of situation where if the tokenomics of the project are sound it will be a sustainable project long term, and that's the whole point. As a guild, you want to be sustainable, and these are these these are the, what we're talking about here: the types of methods and 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 tools and things you can do to potentially stay around for the long haul and not die out like a like a, yeah. any other guild or project. It's a mindset thing as well. It's kind of exactly as you're saying. Uh, you know, at some point you have to step back and say, okay, am I here just to milk this thing until right. it falls over? Right. Or do, do I really believe that P2E can evolve itself into something sustainable, something bigger than it is now? Because if you're in the latter camp, you, you, should be, you should be aiming to stay around until that happens. Because, yep. you know, if you are around and, and it does 
become this kind of society altering thing it could become um then all you're going to need to do is to be there and, and you'll catch that ride rising tide uh and how you can make sure you be there is is by thinking okay you know what are my risks here you know the first is diversifying across games mm -hmm. uh which we talked about a little bit the other thing is thinking about okay the things i own can i protect their value anyway we talked about financial instruments uh i guess the easy way to think about it is like is there any way i can ensure either my earnings or my assets which i have and this might not be direct insurance but it might be something that that is related which is, which is going to be protective for you in, in some worst case scenarios um so i think once once people switch that mindset and, and kind of say okay look th this thing is here to stay there isn't just one game there's multiple game opportunities um you can start to adapt your business a little bit from this basic v 2.0 model we talked about in into something bigger um and, and you can start small and do that yourself and just have an awareness of the risk factors to your business uh, and then as you grow over time, you can get more people involved and get some specialist knowledge. And, you know, the, the other thing here is that, like, every day, different teams are building extra tools to help you do all this as well. Right. Um, yeah. The tools available to aspiring guild owners, uh, there's a bunch of cool stuff out there that other projects are working on. You just have to do a bit of research to see uh, what's available to you to really start to take those steps from, you know, one man band with, with a bunch of scholars and it's working quite well to okay how do i make this last three or four or five years into the future right. yeah jesse could you go back to the previous slide you were on do you have that available yep right here so when i when i look at this and i i, I look past the integrated model there's opportunities for each one of those parts of the triangle to be their own business you know i, I see in the future there's a, a company totally. that tracks the influencers tracks the wallets tracks the the money that's going around and they're providing R and D as a service to other uh, businesses who might be a well, guild is a business model. Right. And same thing with training. There might be a, a company that builds and specializes in training or, or treasury management, you know, it, well, it, and right now yeah. I think there is already a scholar business where you can go yeah. and rent scholars specifically. Right. And we yeah, see so this in other industries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to say on the, on the R and D side, you, you've kind of got, this exists already in the DeFi world. You've got yep. things like Nansen available to you. Um, you know, somebody at some point is going to build a Nansen for GameFi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that might be Nansen themselves. Uh, you know, on the training side, I think that um, this is a separate conversation, but I think the way that play to earn evolves a little bit is um, increasing emphasis on on skill and skilled gaming. Mm -hmm. uh, so so this is where there's going to be more leak over with, with actual kind of esports and and pro gamers and things like that. And certainly in that world, this exists, right? There's all kind of like, you know, uh, training programs and things like mm -hmm. that, and, mm -hmm. and, and and actual places where you can go and get strategic lessons for for how to perform better in games at the top level. So. You know, the, the model's already there. It just needs to be adapted for, for play to mm -hmm. earn. And, and, you know, treasury, like you say, uh, I, I think it is going to be difficult for smaller guilds to do the same kind of things we're doing with, without mm -hmm. the professionals on the team that we have. But something we're looking at and, and promoting now is actually offering some of the things we're doing to smaller and medium-sized guilds uh, in a beta form in the next three months with the eventual idea being treasury services as a service um, and this doesn't just mean kind of managing your stack uh, it means some of the things like you know hedging your revenues um, how you can ensure your asset base what are the options to you as a small business uh, almost like a consultancy can so, you can you give an example to that say for example that Rome is a guild let's say that we are already have a functioning DAO as a as a business model for our guild what are some examples of how you can hedge to kind of pre to to mitigate risk like what would that look like yeah so um i guess there's, there's two aspects like one is your earning stream and the the other mm -hmm. one is your asset base 
So your your earning streams, um, you know, without getting too technical, you basically know you are going to be long at some point in the future. Uh, long meaning you're going to own some cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. That means between now and that time in the future when you're going to be owning this cryptocurrency, you're going to have exposure to price movements in it. And you can basically take that exposure out by taking the opposite position um, and selling what you're going to have in the future. Well, let's use um, a real world example. Let's say that with Star Atlas, which our, our guild knows that we're very active in, how would you do that with an asset like Polis? So the easier example is probably actually um, with, with Atlas, right? So if you're staking a ship and you know what the yield is at a given time, so you know in the next week or the next two weeks you're going to be receiving X amount of Atlas, what you can do then is you can go and you can sell the Atlas perp for the same equivalent amount. Uh, you know, this is a simplified example. There's technicalities yeah. how you can optimize it even more. But by selling that, it, it means that if the price goes down, the atlas you're going to receive in the next two weeks is going to go down in value. Mm -hmm. But because you are short, um, that short position is going to go up in value. Mm -hmm. So you, you effectively have, have locked in your USD earnings there for that period of time. Now, what that also means on the flip side if you want to be a passive spec speculator, it also means if the price of Atlas goes up, um, your short position is going to lose you money. Mm -hmm. So you've added stability, but you've also taken away, um, you know, the chance of upside or downside. So are, are there services or are you guys internally working on some sort of options model for these? Because that's really what you're describing, right? Well, well, that example you can really do it with 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 the you know the simple financial instruments which are available. Mm -hmm. um, but like I say, uh, that there are counterparties happy to do more complex financial instruments mm -hmm. uh, on on these in-game currencies, and there are conversations to be had. And like I say, I think the market for these will grow as people understand more the power as a lever. Uh, financial instruments can have mm. on game economies right and and i and i think it's interesting that a, a lot of people are being led to learn this via triple a games like axie infinity being the 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 director of of every every guild management and, and to, to to appeal to more game or, or specialized esports games people who are going to be better at playing the game right so that that, that already is a risk management hedge uh, right, getting everyone who owns scholars to understand, like, hey, just grinding the lowest of the arena with your MMR is not the best way to go about it. It's not the best way to think about it, and it won't last forever. Exactly. So it's, it's not so, sustainable. Yeah. Right. right. So across any game, you're going to have people who just are dumbfounded by, oh, you know, f these games. They're they're trying to take our money. We can't feed our children. Like, you, there's a whole spectrum of emotion wrapped up in. If you just look at the fifty thousand foot view of things as MMA is doing, uh, a lot like providing services specifically, but in in a in a in a larger sense, if you're building a game, you can't technically do this for every guild management uh, a, a guild out there. You know, a scholar management uh, guild. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what you have to do is develop the game in a way that's going to forcefully direct everyone to pay attention to these things that we're talking about here instead of specializing on them. And that's going to be up to the individual guild uh, leaders themselves to learn if they don't know anything about or to then partner yep. with people who are specialized. In it's, this. So, exactly. It's that right. switch of mindset again from exactly. okay, living in the now, Yep. living in the now to going, OK, what's going to happen in the next six months? Right. How, how are things going to look different? And, and what we've what we've touched on is, is this evolution increasingly to skilled gamers right. and mm -hmm. the importance of strategy. You know, for me, that's another reason I'm so happy about this uh, th this partnership with with Rome is, is the synergies on that side where you guys are really embedded in the strategy already uh, in Star Atlas and, and beyond to other games. And I and I think people are probably sleeping on that a little bit, because by the time you know it becomes necessary to have a, a well thought out strategy and to have high skilled gamers on board, 
a lot of these uh, medium-sized guilds are going to be scrambling a bit because they won't right. compete with the people who have built these teams of skilled gamers from solid gaming backgrounds and, and brought them into their guild uh, and prepared them with the right tools to go and, and play in these games. Exactly. I, I, I want to add to that, like, what's the culture of the leaders in any particular guild setting forth for the for their members? Is it one of those, like I said, that hamster wheel of the next popular project that you can just pimp out? Even though they'll be here in the long run, the earning potential will decrease over time or as more people come in. The, you know, so it's just like, what do you want for the long term uh, for your for your business because essentially that's what it is whether you're going to acknowledge it or not or operate it as one or not um, and if you don't it'll fail uh, in the short term but well, it seems not, yeah it, it seems to me that uh, we're, we're going to run into a position where you know the job market if you will for these skilled players they're going to have a little bit more say in in their pay rates and um, who they're going to go to and i see a future potentially where a guild might bring in a, a very skilled player at, as a loss leader just for name recognition and to bring that person in and, and attract other people. Um, so the dynamic is going to change from just people who are craving to get that scholarship money to people who can actually say, well, what are you going to give me if I come and play for you? And that's yeah. happening already, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. guilds, guilds have pro gamers and ex-pros kind of promoting their guilds mm -hmm. when right now, you don't need pro level mm -hmm. gameplay right. skills. Um, and so th those pros aren't playing any games. They're there to market. Yeah. Um, they might, they might play an esports tournament, you know, once a quarter right. wearing the badge of, <laughs> of the guild, but it's a marketing exercise, as you say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that, there's just a lot of that going on outside of gaming, the music industry, Snoop Dogg, right? Gala games, or you look at the celebrities coming in, you know, traditional financial institutions, right? Yeah, you know, you know, Heineken's with their dot ETH, you know, like for the Super Bowl, who knows what's going to show up there, right? Uh, you could guess Paris the Hilton, section. She's in the mix now. Yeah. You know, she's the monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so take your pick. It's, it's happening across many different markets and industries. Um, so if you're just a gamer, just, you know, something to pay attention to. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we talked a bit about here as a guild, as a business. So I think we kind of have an idea of like who are some of the different uh, pieces of this puzzle here. Uh, guild owners, in this case, it's like metaverse nomads. Uh, scholars uh, could be guildies or it could be uh, actual scholars. And we do have scholars within Rome. Um, I've got uh, uh, some teams running for Axie as well as uh, Pegaxie. So uh, in both cases, I've got scholars. So I understand the relationship there. Now, you, the, the next slide that you had here was talking about risk management. And I wanted to hear just a bit more about that because mm -hmm. for me, and I've seen so much of this, and this is like, this is kind of how, what inspired me to get involved in this space because I've seen this strange thing happen uh, thus far where certain games will lead with hype more than utility. They'll lead with things that just give you enough to plant the seeds that you create the rest in your mind. And there's a lot of folks in the space that are gamers and just that gamer mentality is that we love to fantasize about things. And so it ends up being an emotional play when you get involved in a project. And so we see a lot of people that end up chasing projects. So what are some of the things that an individual uh, be it someone that is just looking to uh, in, in, uh, be a part of play to earn games or if someone's looking to build a guild or group around uh, play to earn. What are some of the risk management things that should be considered and what do you guys consider yourselves? Yeah, so I, th I think um, what's important here is to always have, you know, if not formalized, a mental framework for which games you're going to play, uh, what are going to be your red flags and what are going to be your kind of key decision points. So it, it, it's very easy if you've been playing games a long time or you've been a crypto native for a long time to say, hey, you know, I've got an intuition. I've been around long enough. You know, this seems like it'll be good. Um, but when we're talking about a business and we're talking about longevity, you really need to make that a little bit more scientific. So... Um, you know, I, I think anyone looking to, you know, become more multi-game, to diversify their exposure to other games, uh, should definitely be thinking about what is their framework 
um, mm -hmm. and, and how do they think about that? Uh, to give some ideas, um, you know, everyone, there's no right or wrong answer of, you know, what is the right framework? Different people will look for different things, but, you know, certainly the obvious stuff you would look for in any crypto project, who are the team behind, um, you know, are there any red flags in terms of the tokenomics and how that looks? Um, you know, one thing we are looking at a lot now is, okay, outside of the tokenomics, what do we think that means for the actual game economy and sustainability of the game? Uh, how long or short will the game cycles be in a given game? Yeah. Um, you mentioned you mentioned team at the very beginning. So is a docs team a thing that you guys look for? I mean, how much weight does that carry that you actually know who the leadership is behind a project? I, I, I think I think what you really want to look for is can the team do this? Um, if it's a bunch of anons, you don't really know if they can or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't think having a fully doxed team is necessary, but I think you want to know uh that at least some of the kind of key leads in the team have a track record uh and can deliver what they're promising yeah it's just it's just one it's just kind of one item um a, across everything uh so i really think when you're talking about a, a framework you need to consider all all the factors but like right. i guess what you're getting at is Okay, do you not touch totally anon games? Um, that's going to vary mm -hmm. from person to person, right? Uh, but it would definitely carry a big weight when you know we're having our internal conversation of, you know, do we do we go into this? And, and, and by the way, you don't have to kind of be on off for a game. You don't have to be all in or not play it at all. You can always right, stick right. a few thousand dollars into a few assets, go and get a feel for the game, see what the mechanics are like. Um, see what the fluctuations are like in the currency and scale into it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a that, that's part of, part of our process. You know, having this multi leg scaling where we do our in game R&D, understand the strategy, understand what other players are doing um, before we decide, OK, this looks viable. This likes it could looks like it hmm. could be something that could work for us. Are, are there any key indicators for you guys as it relates to identifying projects that have longevity or uh, the stage that the project is currently in? So that as you decide whether or not, uh, you know, they're 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 probably some of the opportunity probably isn't there anymore. Like, what are some of the considerations there? I mean, before yeah, so, Casper goes into, uh, uh, <laughs> just to elaborate before that, it, I'd say, when what's your decision making process as an individual? Right. Because one of the things here is critical thinking skills, good. right? So, but I think yeah. that's lacking. I think that's one of the things that's <laughs> lacking in this space is critical thinking. <laughs> so I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to lead into a slide in a minute to talk about the journey of education we've seen in the space from the start point to now. And I think that's a big underpinning theme of everything we've just discussed here, knowledge and education. There is no right and wrong answer, and you don't know definitively if something's going to be viable or not. You say that you think there's an absence, and I agree with you, by the way, of critical thinking skills in the space. But I think that's a transition of not treating these projects and thinking of them like you're a gamer and thinking of them like, what is this? This is a waste. It's the whole know. mindset thing again, isn't yeah. it? It's like, you know, are yeah. you long term or are you just here, not really sure what's going on, but you're getting the dollars in? Um, All right. Yeah. Just wanted. To, I wanted to. Sorry. Did. I just, let me just get my thought out before it runs uh, out of my head. But to, to the point of the topic is that it really comes down to the individual. Just like we're saying, it, there's a multifaceted onion approach of, of what to look for in a project, which we all can name you know, a plethora of them, mainly you know, the Discord, the uh, anon anonymity of the, the, the team and, and all of those things. But if you're coming from the point of view of short-term mindset, then it doesn't mean anything to learn about anything more than if the if the project is being traded and so then you could flip because you're not going to be around and caring about the economy of any game if you're going to not be here for the long run so you won't go the length to read the white paper to see if it's a sound project to tokenomic wise or you know governance wise or how, however the however it's set up so i just think it's it's you it, it you could really cut the conversation short in that sense of just simply asking like how long do you see yourself being in in this space do you see yourself building anything if you're not, then you're an investor. And just like with co with traditional companies, if you invested in, in the stock market at all, 
do you not care about how the company is ran, the, the balance sheet, what the money is going towards, uh, because you are a shareholder. So are you, are you a, a backseat type of investor, not caring so much, but just investing off of hype, right? So all of these things kind of intertwine uh, into the crypto world. Like if you're going to have your, your bad habits from the investment world of traditional stocks, then you're not going to be that successful here either. It's just kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not that different, but in the sense of the, the, the new culture and, and era of, of how businesses grow and what they become in this space, it's, it's you know, somewhat different. Hmm. You know, I, I think from a risk perspective, there's some some good stuff we could theory craft or dive into here. So, you know, we've got a scholar base and we've talked about them being a, a base that needs to be um, elevated in skill. Right. And then we've got people who are leading guilds, um, but there's a group of people who are neither. Right. There's a group of people who are passionate about the game um, and who are there for the cohesion, the loyalty. And I'm wondering if if one of the risks that is going to be out there, if you're attracting a scholar base that flows, um, you know, where the, the best return is, or you've got skilled players who go where the best return is, when, when something goes south for a few moments, can you expect them to stick around? And I think I look internally to Rome, and we've got people who are just loyal to the nth degree, right? They, they're going to be Romans to the day they die, um, and they're not going to... Ch- they're not here to chase the best return. They're here because they like the camaraderie and the, the um, um, relationships that form. Now, when you get to a game that's or a guild that might be multi-game, how do you move that from game to game and keep it? I mean, it, or, or you have some people who are there for space sim, but maybe they're not into fantasy. So maybe you won't be able to get that whole guild to pivot, or you might spread yourself too thin. It seems like there's a lot of potential... Um, and again, this is not, this isn't, this isn't really just thinking out loud. It's not about pointing fingers in any direction. Uh, but there's so many things operationally that can challenge uh, a successful business like this if you spread yourself too thin. I mean, Casper's going to be able to give you a much more financially sound answer than me in a moment, right? But I agree completely. I'm going to be honest. But what you, you've said something at the start of that point that's really like, it resonates with me. For a game, I believe, and not just P2E, but in any space, for it to be mm-hmm. successful in the medium or long run, you need people who play the game because they enjoy the game, mm-hmm. right? So that's got to come into your decision-making if you're deciding, I want to be in a project for the long run. And we can compare some existing P2E games with Star Atlas. There are mm-hmm. aspects about Star Atlas that will appeal the fantasy space exploration, that aspect, the depth that's possibly going to be there the world, the law, the theory crafting that's going on, right? There is a very strong possibility that people are going to come and they're going to play the game and want to succeed and be part of a community as you're seeing in your discords and stuff now because they want to. I don't believe, this is purely my opinion, that a game can succeed in the long term if everybody's here to just print money. There have to be people that play the game because they want Mm -hmm. to play the game, right? And like you say... I think that's what's going to make this year so interesting. We're finally going to start to get some options, and uh, the further we get into blockchain gaming, uh, yeah, the more competition there's going to be for guilds and games altogether. I have a quick question as it relates to that, because this is one I think we've talked about on the show, but I don't know if we've ever directly asked this question. How long do you guys think it's actually going to be before we see a real mmorpg be it space with star atlas be it uh, fantasy world where there's an actual in-game economy that is functional where there's crafting where there's those types of things that we anticipate like what the true gamer wants out of these how far do we think we're off still from the realization of that well end of this year next year i think a project like star i i Again, it's purely anecdotal. I have no inside information or proof of this, mm-hmm. but I think we all know there's a lot of eyes on projects like that, right? And mm-hmm. from AAA mainstream developers, if they see that project start to succeed, they will be with us imminently. And if it doesn't, looking at the money that's still been invested, I believe it will be like a Pegaxi and Axie situation where it will be slower, but they'll try and learn the lessons. Mm-hmm. So... Um, my, my kind of take on this, and, and I think our our take as a group is that it's going to take time for for games to get more sustainable. 
Um, so I'm not really looking to a point of time where games are fully sustainable. I'm just looking for games to become more sustainable, where we can, you know, we can actually understand the game cycles a bit better, like real world economies, you know. Um, there's so many like good uh, thought leaders now talking about, okay, how, how can we help to get uh, games with stronger uh, economies what are the levers you know do do these games need a kind of central bank like we have in the real world in emerging economies you know do we use financial instruments for that are we missing something in between the the source and the sink with how we deliver those in-game economic activities whether that's trading or crafting or whatever uh you know locked tokens do they have something to play in this some games are experimenting with that uh, and, and i think it's really an evolution where people are seeing what works well what doesn't work well so um i i, I think we're going to increasingly um come close to more and more sustainable games which means the p2e businesses themselves become more and more sustainable uh what i wouldn't do is pin and say okay the code's going to be cracked in two years um, mm -hmm. because I, I don't know if that's the case. You know, another another thing which will be important is you know how mainstream does this become? Mm -hmm. um, and those two things are interlinked: sustainability and 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 I guess um, how solid is your user base? Right. You're going to come to the uh, like you hinted at earlier, Ray, talking about Snoop and penetrating the mainstream through different mediums, right? That's a. I think that's a question I'd like to ask you guys. How long do you think we're good before we see a AAA developer actually get a presentation and throw something a sustainable project out there or a proposal? I, I think that there is a few of them jockeying. Uh, your mic is up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Yes. All right. So I think there's a few jockeying for position. I think Star Atlas is the furthest ahead, uh, and the truth is, when we if we were to if, if all of the games were available immediately. If there was a fantasy MMO, that's actually more my jam. Actually, what Mirandus was building, that was the first draw to me. But the truth is, I can't even say with certainty that I'd be able to play that in my lifetime. I just don't think that they're anywhere close to where I can see that. I, don't, I think that all of these games are going to go through phases where now it's like, okay, we have to seed the economy. And we're going to learn things from that. And then we're going to pivot and say, okay, well, what we thought we were going to do now layer two of the economy of this virtual economy looks like this. And so we're in this early, such pioneering wild west stage of all of this that it's too soon to even know what it looks like. And it's going to be trial and error by any company that chooses to jump out there in the forefront like Star Atlas, which is why I'm super excited to see what they're going to do with Cream, where they're going to introduce crafting, because that's going to tell us so much about the impact on this virtual economy. The first stages is, are they creating something that's sustainable and that's eventually going to take on a life of its own? How long will they have to seed it before it becomes this yeah. entity of its own economic propulsion? Yeah. I, I think it's going to happen sooner. Uh, I mean, I don't think it's going to come from the direction that we're, we're thinking. I mean, if you look at the large acquisitions that have happened recently yeah. with Microsoft and Sony, my personal belief is they're going to take a current IP that's already popular um, and turn it into some, some form of either hybrid play to earn format or try to go all the way. Um, and I think it's the big game development companies that are going to bring out the first, maybe uh, pre previous generation AAA um yeah. content yeah i i think that as well i was going to bring up those major acquisitions that took place and nevertheless although that happened and it brings a lot of attention i can't help but compare what axie infinity has done in the bear market since 2018 and how far along they are although they don't ex share that enough because for DeFi kingdoms there's a whole bunch of items in the game that are tradable and and tokens that you can swap for one another on the decks if katana is the native decks as as uh, as DeFi Kingdoms is is one itself, then to add more items that are tradable, it's not the 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 the, the breaker of worlds. It's it might be more simple than we think, but again, it's the bigger economy of how everything is going to be sustainable as you introduce all these different tokens that are in-game items that can be used to to. So it's a it's a more dynamic type of uh, type of thing to handle, and these big companies might have the resources to do so to to hire out people, but. It, it, that's all a lengthy process 
And and then mm. for for the, even like Star Atlas, they express it all the time. We hired 50 people in the last month. Okay, now they have to get acclimated. They have to learn the ropes of what the the goals of within the project and what they're trying to do, depending on the department they're in. And it's just like there's a lot of tedious like things that need to take place first before we see anything. So I don't even expect a big a bigger company like we see these acquisitions taking place you know coming out with something that's operational if anything i'm more confident in, in a DeFi native team who've been here for many years that are generating you know or have the same amount of money than one of these big projects uh, one of these traditional gaming companies own uh, or have uh, come out with something beforehand but again it's going to be that trial and error for a long time uh, i, well, I actually is... love i love the thought process there banjo uh, and, and there's a really nice way to, to frame it is you know there's two ways to come at this you can build a game on top of an economy or you can build an economy on top of a game yep um and, and i guess we're going to know the answer which is the fastest route to to success here Wait. because some people will try like you say existing ip you, you know that 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 takes years off right if you've already mm -hmm. got a functioning game and you can then yeah. embed or enhance the economy inside it you're shortcutting a lot of these guys who are building a game on top of an economy um by quite a decent period of time and you're going to have that first mover advantage, advantage if you yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's a variable we before. haven't discussed sorry jesse there's a variable we haven't discussed is there's companies building back end for this process right so you've got like forte games is they haven't even announced what they're doing they've announced some partnerships but their whole goal is to build the back end of of blockchain gaming um so there's companies that aren't up front and center in the space we're, we're looking at the projects that we like like star atlas and, and mirandas mm -hmm. but there's businesses that are obscure that are doing this this work already mm -hmm. and we just aren't we don't know about them I think the difference between the the stuff that's being built in the DeFi space versus the big giant acquisitions we're seeing in the corporate world is that the corporate world is never going to build it from the perspective of wanting to power the individual. And I think that's where the, De the DeFi comes in. And, and because of that, I think they're going to keep hitting roadblocks. I mean, we're seeing like meta kind of fall apart with, with, you know, with what they're approaching simply because it's going to be a hard pivot and they don't have the trust of the people to build out what, at least the metaverse that we see, they might be an on-ramp for the traditional gamer because it's familiar and they can make that kind of a relationship. But when it gets down to the real virtual economy that sits underneath, I think that that is something that's going to be built in the DeFi space, and it's going to be the economic, the economy first, and gamify sitting on top. Which occurs to me is how Star Atlas is going about it. Yes, it totally is. This is quite a good question that's, by yeah. Watson. Could a pivot to chain save Star Atlas? And uh, I don't think it could really, because uh, one of the main things about all these DeFi project games uh, is that they are getting the crypto people who believe in it and all these star citizen people i'm not sure how many of them would accept like a change to a uh, tokenized economy or nfts being uh that being like how they would fund it from now on because they are having trouble with uh how much runway they have left now on their current funding it'd be a well, hard so know, the next yeah. the next comment in the chat there is you know there's their belief that the star citizen community hates anything crypto related. And I think that goes all the way back to public sentiment. And if you think about how quickly the public can turn on a project, I mean, we just saw one this week that um, had a lot of uh, fanfare behind it. And within a day, it was getting a lot of hate um, uh, because people spent money and then they were asking them to spend more money. Um, and we know that the gaming community can be one of the most toxic communities out there. We've probably all been part of a project or exposed to a project that had the best of intentions, but didn't deliver. And then all of a sudden it's the worst game of the year. Mm -hmm. And Just, I think PTE games can suffer from that as well. We're a long way, really. Mm -hmm. I, I just to add to that, like, I'm sure all of us in our own spare time are still involved with like mainstream gaming communities away from like P2E and crypto. And it's really interesting for me whenever I like two of the communities I love the most and have been involved in is uh, the eSport FIFA sports game and Call of Duty, right? I'd, some of my like regular old people that play like semi-competitive Call of Duty or just play for fun, you mention this kind of stuff to them. 
and they're a million miles away from accepting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. A million miles. Because it's really easy for us to sit here and discuss in a long-form discussion for two hours, as you guys do every week, because we're so entrenched in that now. Mm -hmm. The mainstream audience is still a long way. So if you it take is. a community like Star Citizens and just present them with this thing that they're not that familiar with, probably very skeptical of, mm -hmm. It would just probably it's probably just too far away. I think we could be four or five years away easily before we yeah. see mainstream gaming communities start to actually welcome and embrace crypto and PT. Yeah. One of the yeah. things that I think can change that, and I think that this industry desperately needs, whether it fails or not, we need to see how it plays out, is to take something that the gaming industry is intimately familiar with, a world of Warcraft, and take something like that off the shelf and figure out a way to implement a blockchain-based virtual economy because it's already proven to be playable. It's already proven to be interesting. It already has a marketplace. It already has many years of people farming gold and selling it for real-world value, selling those items on eBay and other places. So we know it has a long history that's accepted, but what would something like that look like if it sat on chain? I think yeah, that somebody, when we see that, it could fail, but we're, at least it needs to play out for us to understand whether it will work or not. Yeah. So if see, you look at a game that may have been, uh, you know, just lost to time, like EverQuest or something, right? Something that people played a lot way back when, but no one really talks about today. If somebody picks that up or picks up the source files for it and, and throws PTE into it, everything's there. Right. And, and we know that the modding community is some of the best community for advancing games out there, usually graphically and, and from sound, but also from the back end stuff, too. So uh, all it would take is one good small group of developers to take an old IP that no one touches anymore and, and kind of give you a proof of concept. Yeah. With this question here, I don't think that uh, Star Atlas needs to buy Star Citizen. I think Star Citizen is running out of runway, and Star Atlas is just going to continue to scoop up their talent, their which talent. they're already doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, guys. So with that, I want to jump back in because we, we, I want to be respectful of your, your guys' time there, uh, MMA. And one of the things that I thought would be really cool to share with our audience is what you guys have done. You kind of started off doing a lot of stuff in the shadows. I mean, you weren't trying to be uh, all flamboyant and, uh, and and get yourselves out there and, and do lots of marketing. Instead, you were doing some fundamental proper company building behind the scenes. And then now you're starting to open that up. Uh, you guys are in the middle of doing some stuff yourself. Uh, before we jumped into that, I did have this one slide that I wanted to talk just a, a bit about, or at least have you guys kind of share some cool. thoughts as to how you see like the people in this space. And, and let's let that be a lead in to what you guys are doing and why you created what you're creating and tell us a bit about it. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, for my part of the answer to that question, this is actually perfect to lead into it, right? So <laughs> we'll focus on the scholars part right now, because that kind of is an easy answer for me to talk about what I've been doing along with the rest of the gaming operations of MMA, is we've been slowly and gradually building up an organic like growth of scholars in Axie. We didn't go down the conventional approach, it's fair to say, of putting on Twitter, there's a scholarship, apply, or... <laughs> you know, open a Discord up or a competition. We actually built it up from 50 to about pretty much organically. Word of mouth, trust. That was a big thing for us. You know, in the Philippines, for example, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, like that, right? Very organic. And a similar thing with our partners in Brazil with Carl. They've got a vastly different infrastructure to us. They had an application and vetting process where they were looking for good quality gamers who could prove that they were skilled at, say, turn-based games and communication. And that shows like the contrast between our approach and theirs. And we took a very gradual approach initially of building up a network of trust. One thing we noticed is in the community of our Axie gamers, right? A lot of them know each other or then if they've got to know each other because person X knows person mm -hmm. Y invented, invited so on and so forth. And you built up a real, a real strong, close-lit community. That's taught us a lot when we think about know your people. For perspective, are you guys able to share like any any numbers, like just so people know to scale, like you guys actually are significant players in the Axie space? So we like administer, we've administered about just over a thousand accounts now wow. yeah. all across the world to Brazil, to the Philippines, Argentina, Germany, the United Kingdom, if you include people like myself, the US, all over the world, really. 
And we've got these small sub communities in their own like regional areas. So we've got like a Filipino community that predominantly communicate together, a South American, so on and so forth. Right. And in on the slide in front of us, we're talking about like community trust, training, mentorship. We've been really lucky to learn a lot of lessons that I think other people found hard during the recent economic turmoil of Axie because we had such a strong, close-knit group of scholars in their individual area, they know each other. They want to support each other, encourage each other, coach each other if one of them posts, I'm struggling with this team, I don't know how to deal with a, a Terminator, how do I do it? And then you get a series of, and it's just about networking, I guess, building that trust. And then the question is, other than economic reasons, why would I want to stay with this guild if I'm a scholar? Well, yeah, I could look and fish for an extra 5% from 65 to 70 or, but what am I losing? I'm losing a community of people who I know, I've got to know, that are sharing right. information with me, that are actively trying to encourage me to get better. We really like to try and reward uh, scholars that do that. So we've effectively promoted quite a few coaches and stuff up through the system because they've taken the time in their days to coach and help other people. It's organic growth, kind of what you'd want to see in any kind of ideal community or company, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. how can we incentivize the, people yeah you go on the, the, yeah and, and it's really actually interesting to see how different guilds in the in the space are are approaching this and there's there's some really cool like differentiated um aspects like you see some girls offering education general education to their scholars as kind of part of the community package uh other places it's about you know financial empowerment and helping them understand how to manage their finances. So I think this is where the the concept of P2E can really go almost beyond a pure business, but, but actually into this wider um, social impact aspect, um, you, you know, when, you know, not only have you got an operating business that's giving people work, it's actually really changing lives. And that's, that's actually the appeal for, um, a, a decent um, subset of investors. So, you know, investors are primarily driven by returns. So, you know, it's sure. important when you're talking about play to earn that you um, communicate with the right people in the right way. Um, you know, pro gamers are going to be less interested um, than the investors are in, you know, what the um, financial opportunities are in terms of hedging and staking and long-term rewards and more interested in just okay what games are we going to be playing who am i going to be playing with how can i win and also yeah okay how much how many dollars can i take from this um but it's going to be a, not, a lot more nuanced uh kind of hierarchy of needs if you like right. so I, I think what we really wanted to say with this is when you're um when you're upscaling your business and, and trying to pitch to different groups of people what it is you're doing is to always bear in mind um, the different set of eyes people are going to be looking at your business with. So if you're looking for capital from someone, um, they're going to want to hear a different perspective to if you're, you know, looking to get a ex-pro gamer on board to help you with strategy, or if you're looking to increase the size of your scholar network. Um, and that was something which we identified early and probably why we have been in stealth in terms of the the gaming guild scholar community as we we very much in this early stage been focusing on on that investor community uh, on on pitching the business to them and really understanding the risks around it and, and how we can make this attractive from that perspective um it, it's the stage after capital raise where you you almost pivot a little bit and say okay now we just need to do the do the job what what do we need to do it we need the infrastructure we need the tools we need the team uh we need scholars we we need those gamers for the eventual uh evolution to skilled gaming we need the partners which are going to help us fill in the gaps we've got as a team which are going to give us synergies um, which are going to help us kind of grow quicker and more effectively uh with the ecosystem there's just one little thing there as well. We've got on the slide, feel good and part of the story. It's easy to forget when we talk about all the economics and the incredible numbers that float around in the space that on a scholar and individual person by person basis, there's very few industries in the world, to my knowledge, where you can find somebody and help them actually economically so clearly. 
right. about any exploitation right. and it's genuinely a mutually beneficial partnership there are so few of them in the world and i think it's easy to forget that that we can <laughs> succeed as a business while genuinely wholeheartedly helping somebody out in a part of the world that needs it in a time that they need it yeah that makes a lot of sense i mean and for me my i have a limited experience between axi and peg peg axi uh with having scholar teams and there was a period of time where if a project happens to be in a lull um as as it has been i've had scholars you know within uh, within axi that have been struggling as the as the price of slp has been down low and then now as i've kind of been exploring things in another project and that's not to say that it will always be that way with axi axi will probably pivot and make some changes that bring opportunity back but what i see as interesting with what you guys are doing because you're developing a landscape you're developing kind of like a portfolio of projects you know you're able to probably do some things to create opportunity that are uh, lateral moves for maybe even some of your scholars as 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 i've done with some of my scholars from one project to another while there's opportunity for them to earn within peg axi perhaps over axi and then who knows, maybe there'll be an opportunity for them to come back and make an, an equal portion. But it's the things that I've seen that you guys are doing that I really appreciate is you're looking at each group of people that participate in the ecosystem that you're creating, be it the investor and the opportunity that they have, be it the scholar in stabilizing it. And I've listened to some of your town halls and some of the things you guys talk about where you're trying to create an environment that creates stability, not just for what you as an organization are able to create for returns for yourself and for your investors, but also to stabilize the impact on the scholars that participate in what you're doing. So to me, that's that's pretty awesome. Um, are you guys able to share a bit more about what you guys have done? I know that you guys are in the middle of launching. You've already done some impressive things. Can you share a bit more about that? Yes, sure. So. Um... We, we basically are in the run-in now to our IDO, our, our token sale. That's on the 22nd of February. There's, there's a really limited amount of uh, tokens going there. Reason being, we did a pre-sale for our early community. Um, so so we, we've effectively done the majority of our capital raise. And, mm -hmm. and these are really um, you know tokens and an opportunity for people who want to get involved in the investment opportunity that is MMA as a differentiated play to earn guild. Um, so I, you know, I, I would say to anyone listening, like, you know, come and jump in to the discord, have a look at the website, you know, do your research, ask a bunch of questions and, and yeah, really understand what it is we're offering. And, and then there's the chance for you to get involved. Can I ask? I mean, it feels the only share stuff that you guys have already shared publicly, but how did it go? Did you guys well? Did you, did you pay? Where you guys stand now? Yes. So um, it was it was really incredible. Um, we, we we were we were going through this pre-sale, um, kind of in the depths of the crypto bear market. Things have obviously recovered a little bit now since then. Um, this this was kind of in the middle of January, um, and it, and and we managed to be super successful. The, the whitelist was oversubscribed, I think, by. Um, you know, 130 percent, and and we essentially sold out all the pre-sale um, very very nice. quickly, uh, and and that was really testament to to actually I think being able to properly vocalize and and talk about you know what the business is and why it isn't just a, a an alt or an alt token here really that you're betting on it. It's actually something that's got long-term legs, um, and and you should be viewing it in that way as an investor. Um, you know, it's not something where you should be expecting any short term pump, but you should really go through the materials that we put together, the kind of ideas we've been talking about today, risk management, being there for the long term, you know, understanding the groups of people um, and see it really as, as a, an opportunity to get involved in an interesting business in, an, in a very interesting landscape that, that's going to change and grow a lot going forward. Yeah, and the other thing we found is since we've done the pre-sale during and after there's an incredible amount and i know some of them are listening so i want to give them a bit of a shout out in our community some of the people that have organically come and started working with us are just phenomenal 
And again, it's that kind of thing that as we enter a new age of business and Web3, and I'm sure you found it with your community building in your Discord in Rome, you find some phenomenally talented people out there, whether it be smaller. It's just incredible, right? We are really proud of the product that we're going to offer in our services. But again, on the other side of the coin, the community that we've started to build, they're amazing. And that's really one of the pillars that no amount of money in the world can help them. <laughs> a dollar amount doesn't have you know an amazing community and that's something we're incredibly thankful for because they're amazing so what were some of the considerations because as you kind of alluded to there a moment ago casper how you guys were able to have a successful pre-sale launch while navigating a market that just kind of took a flip there for a moment and at the same time we have seen other projects miss their mark by a lot and and my heart goes out to them because they're pioneers just like the rest of us and all you can do is 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 put your best foot forward and 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 estimate how you think things will go and if you miss that mark it's really hard to recover from what were some of the considerations that you guys kind of went through to be able to do as well as you've done through this turbulent time yeah i i, I think like the, the messaging is is very important um I've been working closely with uh, our marketing team, actually, in the run-up to our IDO. And something they've been repeating and repeating is it is a lot more important to establish what your message is and what makes you unique rather than just to kind of execute and stick content out there and figuring out. A lot of projects, what, what they tend to do is they'll start kind of executing, putting things out there, and they'll figure out their message along the way. Um, but, right. but by the time you've got that far, it's kind of a bit too late. So um, it's very important to spend a lot of time on understanding you know, what, what you are and, and what it is you want to achieve in the long term. And not only that, um, you know, who, who are you trying to sell the business to? Um, mm -hmm. Who do you want looking at your project and what's going to make it interesting for them? It, com it comes back to the slide a little bit um, and, and it kind of explains how we were able to you know, raise a very good chunk of capital, but yet not be on the radar of barely any other guilds. Yeah. Um, yep. Because because we kind of realized that, okay, if we go out there and market ourselves as a guild, we're probably going to get a lot of great scholars. We're probably going to get some gamers wanting to join us in our strategy, but we aren't necessarily going to get the eyeballs of investors who don't really know anything about gaming, but find Play to earn an interesting concept, want some exposure to the metaverse. Um, so, you know, that, that was a bet by us in, in a way, but it, it definitely paid off. And looking back, I, I think it was the right approach to take. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and where are you at in the process now and what's upcoming? So, yeah, so just kind of to reiterate then, we've done our pre-sale. We've got the actual main IDO on the 22nd of February. Once we've done that um we hope to raise uh, a, a, a few more dollars uh probably it's going to be quite popular so it's going to be another large chunk of, of capital to add to our war chest um and, and then going forward beyond that it, it's all about making the sustainable business deploying those assets you, you know I, I think what we typically have as a framework in our head is you know each dollar capital we get in about 50 percent of it will go into in-game assets uh, the rest will be split between actually building tools, infrastructure, uh, increasing the headcount of the team, keeping a bunch on reserves for the right opportunity. Like you say, uh, there's a bunch of games where mm, big ticket sales are coming. So things like land, uh, which, which you almost have to save up for. Uh, it's not like you can right. suddenly sell a bunch of axes and, and buy a plot of land in Star <laughs> Atlas. Um, right. you're, you're probably going to come unstuck if that's your if that's your approach. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting. Like to, we, We've gone through this capital raise. We've got this early community who are really behind us and, and helping us with every, every section of the business, really from building our white paper to the marketing to, uh, you know, the, the gameplay aspect. Uh, everybody wants to be involved um, and, and we, we want to do right by everybody. So as soon as we've concluded the, the capital raise and, and we've kind of got this early community of backers, um, it, it's then all on us to really keep doing what we're doing and, and deliver on our, on our vision. 
Nice. Yeah, I, I think you're doing a great job at that as well. I would like to ask, but outside of the uh, giveaway that you have running, which you can elaborate on, um, are there any leaks that MMA can share with us for their own community, but also for maybe any Romans and people out there watching? Any any leaks? Because we you have to ask if there's leaks. We like yes. Alpha. So, um, I, I guess there's a couple, a couple of things. Uh, one thing that's been nice about this marketing up up until now is we've really focused on branding and and keeping it professional. Um, so, you know, the the upside of that is, is that you get the right people being interested in your business. Um, so, so we've had a few kind of. Uh, important people from the p2e industry reaching out uh to learn more about what we're doing and and what our vision is and, and how they can get involved or or help um which which for me makes the process all, all worthwhile because because it means what we're doing is is getting through to to the right eyes um on the flip side it's very hard building a community doing things that way it, it's a grind you guys know um, you know, in the end, you can be delivering the best content and value add ever, but if you're not getting the right eyes on it, um, you know, it's going to limit you in growth. So uh, this is why we're kind of combining that with uh, our big giveaway, um, which is launching next week. So um, we're going to be giving away a large amount of MMA tokens. Uh, this won't be like your typical, uh, you know, 10 sol giveaway or win an NFT. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot more at stake, um, but it's also not just going to be a kind of rote, uh, you know, retweet and like. Uh, we, we've actually put together a video with the help of some consultants to really explain in a succinct, exciting way what the play to earn opportunity is um, and, and how to get involved. The, the idea really there is we want people to, to somehow get hooked on, wow, play to earn, that sounds like something that's interesting. Um, I've never heard of that. Like, let me learn more. How do I get involved in this? Because, you know, that's the majority of people. Um, hopefully, eventually it won't be, but that is the majority of people out there. Um, so, yeah, the idea is, is if we can, you know, get some extra eyes, not just on MMA, really, but some extra eyes on P2E as a concept and an opportunity, um, that's really going to, to help drive interest in MMA, but also broader interest um in in what in what p2e can offer to someone who isn't a gamer right so is that to say that i mean a, a, a part of your target market i would imagine it would be are the folks that you're actually partially having to educate on hey there's this space there's this opportunity you've heard the buzzword metaverse uh you may not have heard about you know p2e gaming in the blockchain space and so you're kind of taking those folks that maybe might be investment savvy maybe a touch crypto but introducing them to kind of this, uh, this yeah. market segment uh i actually feel that's a responsibility of anybody in the space um mm -hmm. you know if, if you're sensible and, and you want this to be part of what you're doing in a long-term way, you, you've got a responsibility to to try and, you know, break this beyond this very small niche of crypto uh, and DeFi and play to earn uh, participants. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's an interesting thing, right? Uh, this isn't, this is something that, we, you know, if you bring it up at the dinner table with someone, you don't put people to sleep. That's my experience anyway. You right. get people going, what? no how can that be right. you, you know so it you know once you can actually put the right message out there and and, and kind of s s let people see what what the opportunity is um e even if there's problems to solve right there's no mm -hmm. sustainable economies yet you know there's things which haven't been um been properly solved but there's this what if question right like this mm -hmm. play to earn can can change the world yeah um so, that, so I got a, that is just amazing i got a question speaking of like keeping the people's attention and waking them up here i have a question that i'm sure will stop a few people from typing and and <laughs> focusing on other screens and the question is this what right now are the hottest things in your portfolio and what's on your radar what are you guys looking at and is there a criteria for how you find new things 
So, um, yeah, the criteria comes back to the, this framework, um, and there's a number of things that go into that. Uh, the, there's a lot of games we're, we're playing now, which are very much a kind of a gamified DeFi. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and what we do is we, we allocate um, funds to that, and we buy assets in that game, um, and, and we scale in if we feel like, there is sustainability and we don't scale in if we feel like there is not um rather than pointing to specific games and giving too much uh alpha away i would say <laughs> definitely there is um there's a lot of opportunity on on some of these chains which people wouldn't necessarily look at i think i i think if if you're looking at expanding your uh kind of gaming stable i would say don't be scared to go away from you know, Ethereum or Ethereum forks, um, have a look at Avax, have a look at Polygon, have a look at some of these other chains. Um, there's, there's interesting opportunities there and you really limit yourself if you if you feel like, you know, you don't want to play away from home. Right. I, I have a question and, and without saying who, there's obviously competition in this space. And what do you think competition or more competition is going to bring to the space of, of P2E as a business? I think, um, you know, at some point, the, the front runners right now kind of have the opportunity to do it and say whatever they want to do. Um, and they're, they're, there's a lot of hopium behind some of the projects that are out there. <laughs> um, so what, what do you think competition is going to bring to this space? Well, I mean, we'll start with just the purely gaming side. We're in the infancy of this. We have got a lot of players. If we're going to migrate people from the mainstream gaming audience into P2E, there's a lot of room. We can fit these people in. And if we're going to fit them all in, we are ultimately going to need more players in the game. Mm -hmm. But secondly, you talk about the front runners and stuff. As you say, the pressure is on them. And what I want to see is growth and development and aspiration. Mm -hmm. I, and I would say this, as a salesman's pitch, we are bringing something fundamentally we believe is different to the table. I'm happy about it. I think it gives us an excellent market opportunity. I'd like to see more of that, more evolution, more education, and more progress, because we need to see it. On my That'd side, um, yeah. I, I, I kind of echo that. Like, obviously, you're going to see, you know, competition breeds innovation. That's just natural. Um, you, you can already see now uh, quite a few guilds are, are having their own USP, having their own slightly different way of tackling the problem on top of the core you know, uh, NFT rental system, people are building these um, different interesting aspects that come into it. Um, over, over time, what typically happens, like any normal new industry, you're probably going to have a consolidation. Um, the, the interesting medium-sized guilds are probably going to end up partnered up or kind of embedded in the larger YGGs of, of the world, um, because that that's how industry works generally. Um, but but from from our perspective, uh, what, what we're really thinking is like, look, this is great. Uh, we have got this USP now. We can deliver a lot of value to the sector. We can stand out as a guild. In six months, that's probably not going to be the case. In six months, other people are going to be taking note of what we're doing. They're going to be probably hiring people from commodities backgrounds, from banking backgrounds. Um, so we're always always about okay. Look what. what what have we got next? What's going to be our differentiating factor in six months? Uh, how, how do you how do you stay ahead? Um, so, so yeah, and and, I, and the, the other big guilds out there will will be thinking in the same way. Anyone who's playing long term will be aware that you know you you need to build what, what they call in business. You need to build long term moats. You need you need to build something yep. that that makes you different that people can't attack and just duplicate. Um, that, that's going to give you longevity. Um, so, so that's what we're always kind of a, acutely aware of, and, and that's why we're making these interesting partnerships with, you know, strategic teams like like yourself, uh, with, with you, you know, market commentators, with, with different people from different aspects, to really see where we gain edges across all the different uh, kind of sides of of the of the P two E equation because. You know, edges a road in life generally, uh, in finance, you know, anywhere you'll see that. Um, so if you just sit on something you believe it is an edge and is going to give you infinite money forever, you're going to come unstuck. 
and, and in crypto more than anywhere else where things move so fast edges disappear quickly yeah these um, are so not we're, uh... we're, I'll we're all about that. Before. We're all about okay, long term, but at the same time, we also realize that we we need to be ready for what's going to happen in the next six months. What's going to happen in the next months? Our business is probably going to look very different. There's probably going to be a focus on esports, skilled gamers, the kind of things we've been talking about. Um, maybe even more focus on game economy as as games deliver more transparency. Maybe some games start to lean more on this central bank idea. Um, Things are going to look very different. And if you want to succeed, you're going to need to be agile. I mean, I'd love a more of a development in esports. But the kind, the kind of the point is, these what we're talking to you about today and what we've talked about historically, they're not just our innovations. They're our first innovations. Mm -hmm. We know full well mm -hmm. that whatever we do, if it's successful, other people will do it as well. So we need to keep moving forward and keep coming up with new ideas. That's the trick to succeed here. Not just you sitting know. around. You've got to make some moves. Do you envision a day where traditional finance goes long into this space? I mean, I, right now you're getting investors out of that space, but once you start seeing traditional finance industry push into this space, it, it well, in some ways it's probably a good thing. In some ways it'll probably be a bad thing, but how far out do you think we are from that? I, I think in terms of, uh, in terms of other guilds taking the approach that, that we are, um, mm. I, I think that will that will be uh, a big thing in six to twelve months. Um, that's different to your question, uh, where <laughs> finance is actually going into into it rather than you know P two E pulling people from the tradfi world. And I, I've had some good conversations with VCs in the space, um, and one thing that resonates a lot is that. Uh, Traditional finance people, they don't grow on trees. Uh, and if they do get involved in crypto, they typically go to the DeFi side. Mm -hmm. um, play to earn is a little bit niche um, and it's not obvious yet uh, that the edge and the value that someone from a trading desk at Goldman Sachs can actually bring to mm -hmm. a gaming guild. And why is that? It, it's because up until now, from what we've seen, most people pitch it to the gaming world, mm -hmm. to the other guilds. Um, it's only when you start to go, okay, here's all the bits and pieces of how our business works. Here's all the bits and pieces of how it can be optimized as a business. When things start to click and, and you know, that's essentially how we've managed to convert a lot of our existing investor base really is, is, is going beyond uh, explaining how P2E works, but really into what is the business underneath and what is the opportunities as a business. Yeah, it's an interesting landscape as a whole in, in crypto where it seems like there are things that don't necessarily echo the traditional world of business. Uh, for example, in the traditional world of business, we're used to first mover advantage being a window of time where it extends out a lot further. But like you're saying now, people identifying things that you're doing right, they're going to like, hey, let's snap that up and, be, and put it in play. Uh, immediately and you start to see those things roll out like within the next six months so it seems like the world in this space happens a whole lot faster and you don't have as long a time as a first mover yeah like yeah. I, I think like it's not going to be there's not going to be man, many single game guilds out there in six months time mm -hmm. like everybody will catch on to this idea that you know you don't need to be tied to one game there's a basic concept of diversification where if you're playing three games instead of playing one, you reduce your risk risk of ruin, your risk of you know going bust on one rug pull, um, and that will just become table stakes, right? For, for girls, and at some point having a treasury department or at least paying someone uh, to do your treasury services bit will become table stakes. Mm -hmm. Having a pro team as part of your guild will eventually become table stakes. Um, so, you know, how, how you stay ahead is really taking, looking at the early signs for what is going to be the next thing and how can you position yourself the best for it. Uh, you know, myself, like aside from looking into the marketing and getting ready for our capital raise, I've been spending hours a day really trying to go as deep as I can on game economy. Um, there's, there's just so much... Um, good stuff you can read about that because game developers are working on it long before p2e 
Yeah. Um, so there's there's a ton to learn, and again, it's kind of what Ray was saying. Is like you can't just you can't anymore just think of this as let's go and like stake and keep staking till the emissions go down uh, until I'm not printing as much money from a game because uh, that's that's going to disappear pretty soon. You need to be looking at okay, what are people saying is important and, and getting up to speed as much you can on those. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and even if a guild does want to focus on one game predominantly, it's only going to make sense in the future to uh, diversify and stabilize what you're doing and what you're operating. You don't want, even if you're ultra passionate about it, you don't want all your eggs in one basket. It only makes yep. sense to have a little bit somewhere else just to have that backup plan or stabilize what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think, I Go ahead, Ray. No, I was just going to quick mention that I was there before YGG even had a Discord. So I, I'm one of the proud holders of, of a founder's coin of uh, only 300. So, you know, as as awesome as it is to have one of those, you see the growth in the space as, as what Casper was alluding, was mentioning, actually, of you're going to have to have more games. They, they set the trend as, you know, um, Axie did with the two token model. Um, and that's just commonplace now for to be successful as a guild, even if you don't pay attention to economics or, you know, the financial side of a guild. It's just it makes sense to do that. But, yeah. but then there's another piece that that is challenging, and that becomes the part of the guild, the people that run the guild. Because there are players that show up to play the game and they only want to focus on the one game. And the best that do it are only going to focus on the one game. And so you as a guild owners and, and those that run guilds need to kind of run buffer for them to feel like they're in a guild that is only focused on a game. Because if you start to diversify so much and all of your communication is spread across the board, then you're going to find yourself in situations like, and I will name drop in this instance, YGG, because they're like one of the biggest out there that people recognize recognize they seem to be all over the place and i don't know how their model will do in an immersive uh mmo style game because that takes people that are fully immersed if you know the culture of games in the past like everquest and 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 camelot and and world of warcraft those folks were not playing multiple games they were immersed in that game as a culture and so we need to create space for that as well i mean the thing is you're completely totally right I'll say from going from a mainstream background, if you're an esports player, you play your game. And as a guild, if we have a responsibility to look after these people, they're professionals. It's no different to any other business or any other walk mm -hmm. of life. If we onboard a professional Axie player who trains Axie and practices Axie, and that's our responsibility to look after that employee effectively. Right. You know, we've got to respect mm -hmm. these people's professions and look after them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I like, I like the framing of the question. Uh, like, it, it's really okay, as we move forward. How there's a problem to be solved, isn't there? Uh, how do you unify what's essentially a stratified community, where you know two two guys play completely tight different types of games, not even different games, different types of games with different skills? How how are you as a guild going to make those guys feel like they're part of the same team? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that's where a, a, you know what will come with the move to uh, more skilled gaming being a prerequisite is the requirement for community tools which enable that that somehow how do we bridge this gap how can how can we make people feel like they're getting equal treatment when they're having different games with different amounts of information yielding different uh amounts of dollars um so yeah i think that will that will evolve over time it's definitely something we've kind of got on the whiteboard of you know as we go down that way uh how do you keep that that banner as one well you, it seems to me organizationally you you have two paths you can either outsource it to guilds that are playing the game and are very um, passionate about the game or you have to have some sort of um structure within your organization that allows for maybe game managers that are the guild leaders for that game um, and both probably have their pros and cons um and you know necessary solutions that come with that but um it seems like you you can't just hope that the the passion will follow you from game to game right you have to have people who are passionate in the games that they're playing 
I think that's generally it. If you're going to perform at the top level of a mainstream or even even some games that we're going to see in this space, yeah, that is your focus. That is your passion. And if you choose, or unfortunately, if the circumstances come that you have to migrate to another game, you've got to treat it like a profession. Mm-hmm. And it's the same. It's no different to somebody in the real world that has to migrate from one profession to another. Mm-hmm. When they've spent that amount of time dedicating themselves down that route, you've got to support them if that circumstance changes to migrate mm-hmm. or retrain, if you will. Right. You know, somebody moved from one job to another, you have to retrain and refocus. And that's something that I know we'll take very seriously. And I think, to be fair, a good amount of our competitors in P2E will adopt that mainstream approach of treating people like professionals and supporting them to act like one. Yeah, for sure. I have a question for you guys regarding, um, you know, the, the, the tension between decentralization and centralization, right? There's always going to be a push and pull in one direction or the other. We're seeing some acquisitions in the game space that are centralizing in nature, right? So how long do you think we see a play by whether it's traditional finance or maybe the gaming industry who does an acquisition of, of a gaming guild as we're describing it right now? Um, I, I mean, in my opinion, that depends on how successful they are. Mm-hmm. I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer, but like, I'll elaborate. <laughs> the thing is, there are already eyes on this space. Right. Mm-hmm. And you said earlier your point about how quickly until AAA games uh, like penetrate the market. Well, it's really simple. You can either start from fresh or you can go in with something that's hot and established. Mm-hmm. I know if I wanted to like start up a, uh, a gaming guild, what's easier? Purchase something if you've got the resources that's mm-hmm. already set up mm-hmm. or start organically. And if you've got the economic resources to make that purchase, I imagine they'll do it if they're serious about going into that space and have found it to be a viable strategy. Mm-hmm. In terms of when, Look at the growth of a YGG in terms of raw dollar numbers from 12 months ago to now. Yeah. And we know within the crypto community, some would identify that as selling your soul, right? I mean, that's <laughs> when you talk about it, uh, obviously, the people who stand to benefit from it um, would probably be open to that opportunity. Who wouldn't, right? I mean, at the end of the day, um, you have to take all opportunities and assess them, but there's going to be a portion of the community that's maybe frustrated by that. Um, it, it's going to be interesting. I think this is the theory craft of guilds as a business, right? That we're yeah. talking about. I mean, I, I see that far away personally. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, first, we got to get to the stage where we are kind of moving from real world uh, and using P2E as an on ramp, effectively. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and we're not we're not even there yet. Um, and there's a lot of I think there's going to be a turning point in the next year where you kind of have essentially a, a rebranding of crypto to Web 3.0 um, mm-hmm. because crypto has a lot of negative connotations attached to it from the past 10 years. Um, and, and as we go through that and as we see more and more companies pivoting to this metaverse label and what that means, um, it probably increases in, in likelihood. Um I don't know. It's hard for me to see uh, Google buying uh, Merit Circle or buying YGG or buying anyone else at, at this stage. Yeah. 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 And I don't think I, I don't think anybody, or at least I wasn't framing that near term. Um, no. But you I never think we would have. Yeah. Go ahead, Darcy. No, I think that I agree with you. I don't see somebody purchasing the finished product necessarily but mm-hmm. something that's on the way after seeing the destinations that we've seen in the last year if you look at from point a to b if you could catch that as it's on the ascendancy there's i i believe there's a possibility in the next two or three years you could see somebody say, what if for example we continue to grow and then another guild joins the space and continues to grow eventually prying eyes will see the opportunity and maybe think that one's on the way up let's make yeah. a move and well, you look at some least... of the, I'm sorry, you look at some of the market cap of some of these larger organizations right now, and they're, they're appealing, right? They're, they've obviously demonstrated the ability to generate and collect wealth. Um, and I think people will be enticed by that. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. No, no, it's fine. It's a good point. I think that's kind of the overriding point though. You're never far away in this space from a surprise. True. If we'd have had this conversation even just eight months ago about how much money would be in the space, we'd have all probably said, maybe, possibly, mm-hmm. we'll see. And here we are. <laughs> You're never far away from a surprise. For sure. Yeah, awesome. I, go ahead, Ray. 
<laughs> no, I just wanted to make a point earlier to, to when it's just heartbreaking to when you're transitioning if you started off just having one game with a, with a set of scholars and everyone was dedicated and, and excited about that game that sometimes there's branching off of those players from your guild unless they were making money as a scholar. But if even if they weren't, you know, to, to grow in that way as a YGG uh, set forth the example, you know, having more games come on into your Discord that you guys invest in as, as whoever you are as a guild out there. It, sometimes if you're not prepping the community members with what you're trying to do, it's not going to end well. So you'll have a bunch of channels that appeal to different people, but where's the community? And and that's that's a, a major uh, cornerstone of any success, no matter how much money. And that's why I was talking about on the Star Atlas end, as we talk about it most here uh, and we're invested in, there's a lot of guilds out there who talk a, a big number. And uh, and then when it comes to actual gameplay for speci for Star Atlas specifically, it's it, it might be a different story altogether. Uh, when that time comes, it might, you know, and there's a whole bunch of time before that ever happens to build out some type of structure where there's a cohesive community that cares and doesn't just want money, but it's all a process. Indeed. All right. So with that, I wanted to ask you guys, like, where do people, where do they find you? Where's the best place for them to stay up on top of the things that you guys are doing and what's next? So I, I think definitely give us a follow on, on our Twitter. Um, MMA gaming underscore IO. Uh, then I would say next thing is join the, the Discord. That's where all our community are. That's where you can keep most up to date. Uh, all the announcements come through the Discord before the social media. Um, and the Discord is there on, on the Twitter. Um, you can go and jump in. We've also got our new website up, which is www.mmagaming.io which really is the messaging we, we were talking about at the start of the show um, for how we see play to earn as the business opportunity for people. Awesome. Well, very good. You know, it's been great having you guys here on with us. And for those of you that have joined us late, as we already mentioned, that uh, one of the reasons that we really wanted to bring MMA on here with us is because we have been uh, talking with them for quite some time. We've doing information sharing uh, and uh, kind of building a relationship that has now led to us looking to form a partnership. Uh, and of course, as time goes on, we'll be able to share a bit more about what that looks like. But also, we anticipate wanting to have you guys back on the show uh, here from time to time to share your perspective, especially from uh, you know from the lens that you guys have, having already done what you've done in the financial space and and now bringing that into play to earn. Uh, but just also how you see the industry as a whole. And with that, I don't know if you guys want to stick around, but you certainly are invited to. We'd like it if you could and wanted to, uh, as we start talking about some of the other things that uh, we catch up on within the industry as it relates to Star Atlas. There was a town hall and some things like that. And I know we have a few uh, images and things like that. So you're welcome to stick around and weigh in as we do our theory crafting and just share our thoughts about things as they happen. We will definitely stick around, but I just want to say, uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for the opportunity. It's been a, a great chat. I've definitely actually taken a, a few notes here and, and learned some things my side, as I always do when we watch the show. Um, so, yeah, we will definitely be back. Uh, the, the space is going to evolve. I'm sure there's going to be an ongoing list of different stuff to talk about as things change. So I'm uh, really looking forward to it. Thanks again. You know, awesome. And, and, and just from my own perspective, I think what excites me about this is this is a great example of um, what the future can be for different groups in this space where we're seeing within Star Atlas, there's people that have these utopian alliances that really aren't tied to anything, um, but a lot of dreams, right? So this is really a, more like a business partnership than what we're seeing, you know, we're, we're not asking MMA to come to our rescue when 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 the shit hits the fan uh, in the metaverse, right? It's more, and they may do that, but it's more about <laughs> how do we mutually support each other uh, in the metaverse and outside the metaverse, which I think is the core of a true alliance. Totally, yeah. well said. Yep. All right, with that uh, fancy, what do we have for news? Where do we want to start? So there was uh, another roadmap report this week and uh, quite a lot of information on there. Uh, a lot of it was gone through by Swagger in the interview, not in the town hall. 
that happened this week. Uh, I talked about Polish, the Dow is still hopefully February. Uh, that's a quote. And uh, the next six ships are fully concept complete. I found that quite interesting. I'm really looking forward to seeing what those are. Uh, plenty of new hires around Star Atlas. I think it was 13 within the last 12 days of January. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the town hall as a whole was, was light on big bursts of information. And I think they filled it up with a bit more of wanting to be transparent and say, hey, look, we don't have a bunch of big nuggets to share with you here, but we are growing. And here's some of the things on the horizon. Um, with those new ships, uh, I guess there was supposed to be something like 51 or 59 this year. Like, what do we know? What was that number? Uh, I, I think it was like 52 or something okay, like that. Minus the Titans, yeah. yeah. And, okay. and we've seen one. So we've seen one, which is the uh, that, that rocking space bike. Actually, I wasn't thinking of this one. So this we've seen two then, I guess. We saw this one, which is great. I, I love this thing. But then we saw this thing, which is basically, you know, a seat on an engine, <laughs> which, which I love the theme, like, you know, the whole biker thing theme that uh, they've been going with. My, my question about this one, and you have seen it with, with the X4 as well, they're supposed to be space worthy. Mm -hmm. well, what are the exact physics that allows a vessel like this to, to go outside of the atmosphere? Is that well, something we really see happening? Well, they've been pretty clear that riders would need suits except for the Ooster, right? And beyond that, they are implying that there's some sort of bubble if you're going to uh, hyperdrive or, or, you know, warp to one place to another. The technology is there for these small vehicles to do that. Um, but it, as it stands, humans, or at least mud, can't fly them in space without a space suit on. Right. But it, there is a third ship, though, Jesse. There, there, There's a, an outline. Yeah, here. Uh, Fancy, can you tell us about this, or do you have any more info on this? So, um, I'm not really sure what it is. It looks quite fightery or data runner-ish, perhaps. But, uh, yeah, it's quite hard to tell anything about this from uh, just the silhouette. Like, those little right. corridors between the head part could be, like, large enough for people, or it just could be, like, a bit of reinforcement. And uh, the bit at the front of like the head it, would that be big enough for like five people perhaps or is that just one person or mm, too many questions really <laughs> yeah I, I, yeah it strikes me just by design it strikes me as something that's like a, a one person but who knows yeah you know? me too i think it's ogrika honestly yeah yeah my guess probably ogrika busan maybe uh medium or large So uh, moving on from some of the other items in that town hall, and I'd love to get your guys, you guys to weigh in on this, Dark Swoop and Casper, is like, what were you guys' take on on what was shared about the Dow? I mean, does it feel like they're, they're, are, are, are they on track? Are they struggling? Um, how's it forming? What are you guys' thoughts? Well, I'm glad. I, I'm relieved to see that there's clearly a lot of thought going into it. It's mm -hmm. a soft way of saying, yes, it might be delayed. <laughs> but I would much rather in the grand scheme of things than really mull it out. The, the explanation was short but succinct. If they need time and there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer and they're going to have to take an approach that involves multiple, like, I assume, I think there's probably going to be two or three entities that end up consulting on the final decision and execution of this. I'd much rather see that and have it done slightly slower than rushed out. Yeah. I don't I mean, know how you guys feel about that. It's something they're going to have to build themselves from a, uh, it's not there's nothing they can just buy and uh, utilize. It's a very complex right. type of thing. And uh, yeah, we do want it done properly. And I think I think we're going to see this continually, right? I mean, there's, there's always going to be some new loop that's going to create a, a problem for the team uh, because they're, they are at the leading edge of innovation here as far as putting this type of game into the space. Um, I think what what's on my mind about the DAO is less about the timing and more about the return. And I, I think there's going to be... Um, potentially some surprises of people who are expecting the same types of returns from that we're getting from ships from Polis. And we know that it sounds like they're, they're positioning Polis as more of a governance than an earning uh, mechanism. And that feels like a bit of a step back. And that's not to say that that was the intention, but 
I think that speaking generally for what I think the community received over time was if we look back at the early stages of, of interviews, it was suggested that one of the things that seemed to be a core part of what was developing with Star Atlas was that a year was roughly approximate time that that it was suggested that a person should be able to see. In other words, it was they they uh, Wagner said himself that he thought that a year was a reasonable time for a return on investment. I think that that is generous for sure i think there's some it lives somewhere in the middle unlike the things we're seeing like with some of the games now where people are looking for a for you know a 35 to 40 day to, you know return but with with atlas and with the ships it was hovering somewhere around six percent eight percent and up to ten percent at some point now with what we've heard and, and it's been hinted at it seems like it'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 19 20 percent and I think that that has created a little bit of a concern and turn off for people that are saying, hey, my investment's going to sit there for a while. I really don't know what it's going to do. And that's what I'm going to earn. I, I want know. to throw like, throw some food, some food for thought. Out please here. do. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the this is the skeptical uh, perspective. Um, so what, what happens when you start printing a lot of rewards for a coin? Uh, you mm -hmm. get downward pressure on the price. Uh, mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but Polis is the coin that the Star Atlas team are all allocated and hold. Mm -hmm. That's accurate. So, and private I, investors. Probably, yeah, I, I would probably be looking at that and thinking, you know, is that coming into the decision here? You know, is there is there some some element where the Polis wants to be a little bit protected, if it can? Um, when are people vesting? You know, is that in the next three months, in the next six months already? Um, you know, have, having kind of looked at these projects and the tokenomics in detail, I'd be I'd be looking at that and thinking, okay, is this coming into the decision? What does it potentially mean for dynamics in terms of development and rollout? What does it potentially mean for price action on the respective in-game and governance coin? Um, so, yeah, that's probably a very different angle to, to what you were thinking, but it's probably one that bears bears some consideration. It's a very good point, though. And ultimately, if some of the decision making is based on the rollout of the game, mm -hmm. if this is thinking in the medium and long term, I believe getting that information out there that this is why these actions have been taken, the sooner the better. Mm -hmm. We don't want this kind of thing leaving to the last minute. What, what's your thought so, on, on my angle? Guys, so, I would like to hear. So if I'm clear on your angle, you're suggesting that because they they feel like the governance and that token is twofold one a way for them to can to have uh, to retain control of the direction of the project but also for them to be compensated for the success of the project Correct. and so they're holding that closer to the chest as a result of those two factors is that what i heard uh not as a result of those two factors but i think it's a consideration i think it, okay, it, it must it must come into the decision making mm -hmm. uh you, you know printing and unless I've read this wrong, you guys have probably uh, looked at the tokenomics more recently than me. But printing Atlas doesn't doesn't affect uh, the team directly if they don't hold that as as their kind of allocated uh, compensation token for the project. Printing Polis does, so I, I think it's just an extra dimension to the decision making, which may which may or may not be in play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, my cons question that I've always had with both Atlas and Polis is the amount of that is going towards not so much a team. I always thought that it's appropriate. The team should have this particular allocation, but I'm more concerned on both of those for the allocation towards private, meaning that there's an influential party that is going to have a lot of influence and we don't know who they are or what their intentions or motives are. Mm -hmm. so. But I think it makes sense that they're using Polis as, as part of their compensation package. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I would imagine it's probably has a vesting period tied to it as well. Um, so I totally um, understand and appreciate the perspective, Casper. I think they're, they're, they have a vested interest in protecting that just for the sake of their development team uh, and, and the happiness of their employees. Yeah, to answer your question, I was going to pull this up here. This is straight out of the economic paper um, that in here we can see that um, the 
the the the light gray down there on the bottom is private private token sales and then we've got uh, team which is in the gray and then you have the actual rewards <coughs> pool in the orange and so all the way up through the next couple of years it's substantially uh, in the direction of both the team, which I think is appropriate, but I'm curious again, uh, what will be the impact of, of the private sale? And will that be something that we actually have access to? Will guilds have access to that? Will there be at some point a means for groups to be able to approach uh, Star Atlas and say, hey, we have an interest in, 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 in that portion of Polis? You guys think that's a possibility or is it just something that's completely up to them and they will say, hey, we'll have our private sale and we'll do those dealings? I think logically, for the sake of rapport with the community, you'd have to involve them. It would be very unwise. I think pretty simply it'd be very unwise to not offer people who are vested in actually promoting the project the opportunity. No, the only th th your point, Banjo, about are there people already influencing the decision making, however, that's the kind of thing I think if that is a possibility, that should be out on the table as soon as possible. I, yeah, I mean, is this, is, this, is this, sorry, is, is this not, um, is this not talking about, you know, private investors? Like, are those tokens not already sold? And it could just be, I don't know, an allocation for their Series A investors, for example, that's represented by that rather than a, a kind of future private token sale so what you're saying this could be the vesting schedule that, that we're seeing here that of something that's already been sold it's that's just being typical. released i think that's typical yeah. and in that case what you've probably got is people who are fairly passive seeing this as a an investment and a bet on the metaverse narrative and the star atlas vision who have little to any uh any desire to control what happens in the virtual world um could, could be wrong but it's definitely one to raise i think at the next town hall for clarification but that would be my view looking at this this is the vesting for the early investors and the majority of those probably won't be uh super involved in in the, the minutiae of what happens within within the star atlas world yeah and I, I don't i don't really have a problem with that i think the challenge becomes when they do have the ability to influence gameplay uh one way or another um, or maybe they have an opportunity to delegate the use of their uh, capital polis to somebody who is playing the game for a portion of the profits. I would be more aligned with that. But then it comes down to the, the haves and the have nots. And how do they pick those people? Right. So for those that are engaged in polis, or at least that are polis holders now with the intention of staking, uh, we see the orange there mapped out as the rewards pool. Uh, but that's the rewards pool in Polis. One of the things that I think was mentioned in the town hall recently, or in this last town hall, is that this is not just reward that comes from the DAO staking or emissions there, and that they have allocated some of the Polis for missions and other ways that you can earn it. So mm -hmm. this, in, this is inclusive of the DAO itself, but also uh, ship missions and other ways within game that you can earn that that uh the rewards there is that how you guys heard it yes yes it is yeah okay awesome um so any other thoughts with with polis here i mean i think it was mentioned that uh oh here's one other consideration we do know that the four r's so the 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 expense that you have of ship missions now at one point i think it was about a hundred and fifty thousand uh worth of those um uh, worth of the four r's that were were monthly going into the dow uh, we don't know what that would be used for i think that's where dow vote comes in is it distributed to dow holders is it used for projects is it how will it be used and i'm sure that's gone up because i think that was probably in december that we first heard that mention of how much was going in and if now there's somewhere in the neighborhood of over 200 million in ships that are staked is that right as well? I mean, I think at one point it was yeah, 150. It I think it's gone over 200. Uh, so, with the leaderboard update, we can uh, calculate around that, yeah. Plus all the uh, extra stuff. <clears throat> so from a from a DAO perspective, when I think in terms of 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 governance token, and this is just my own thinking, so I'm I'm open to hearing anyone else share their thoughts on it. If you if you think that 
your, your, your thoughts on this is different. When I think of a governance token in a new project, I think in terms of I am taking the risk alongside of this of the development team because the project is in its infancy and I want to support the project over time. Um, that's what I think in terms of governance rather than something I'm going to use as an in-game earning token. So if that's the case, what what is a, a reasonable amount of return or what is what what do does a person hope to get for that type of support within a project? Does 20 percent, does 19 percent work? Well, there's a lot of traditional finance that would love 20 percent. So, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I'm sure it's very appealing to some people, especially in investor class. I mean, that's that's a pretty reasonable return uh, on a project. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I guess the question uh, is, what's what's the risk you're taking for, for that return? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think professional investors will, you know, like like we've been talking about, they will have a framework, they will have a due diligence, which they will look at, they will look at the team, they will look at, do we think they can really deliver their vision? Do we think there is a greater than X percent uh, probability that they can evolve a sustainable economy is this thing possible um which is cool and interesting right to bring different minds from different places into the equation to look at this and and, and say okay let, let's gather all the data and, and see if we think this thing is a go or, or not um and, and the more people from different areas and different industries we can have looking uh the better i mean that's why it's exciting overall i think to have these big tech players coming in and, and kind of incrementally putting on these metaverse plays in, in different shapes and forms, because it means you're going to have what I call the, the, the cognitive diversity looking at the problem is going to increase. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've all got probably, okay, little differences in our thinking, but we're all probably coming from a kind of crypto uh, gaming background with similar sort of frameworks for how we look at these things mm -hmm. bringing bringing but, people from completely different areas is gonna is gonna help i think we have to allow for the fact that some of the investment is dumb money as well right there's a lot of crypto million out, millionaires out there who will throw money at anything i mean we've seen some pretty crazy investments just because they had the the e sure um yeah. and, and there may be some of that in play as well so from from and there's just talking about different ways to approach it from a gaming guild perspective, right now we see three primary buckets. We see uh, the ship asset allocation, and there's an immediate return we can see from that, even if we're not looking at long-term gameplay and the influence within the game. Uh, we also see Polis, because Polis, right now, we're only looking at the DAO that's influential outside of the game verse, but eventually it will be down to the faction level and even further down to the regional level. So there's some value in having influence as a guild to hold polis for the in-game influence you can have. And then there's the uh, the bucket of land, which is not yet become available, but obviously being a, a land holder is going to be very influential from a gaming aspect. From the outside of you know, like for MMA, when you guys are looking at games as a project that you want to add to your portfolio it, with Star Atlas, like how do you guys look at that bucket wise from those those three buckets I just mentioned, the in-game currency and then the assets that are associated with it, Polis as a governance token and then land sales? Like how would you guys divvy that up? Like what's the considerations? Well, you need a bit of land. No, you need Polis to be able to govern land and uh, well, to transport or uh, craft or do whatever you want to do with your land, you might also need ships. So uh, it yeah. depends like, what I your plans feeling, are. I have a feeling they're going to be, it's going to be slightly more out of our control and that they're going to be interlinked to the point where, like, ex exactly like Fancy said, I think there'll be margins where we can play with them, but I feel like in an ideal world, it's almost going to be proportionate. Mm -hmm. You can't achieve one thing. And well, our aspiration is to, I'll, I'll clarify that. There are plenty of guilds out there, people that are listening that want to focus on one aspect of the game. I'll clarify that we want to look at this from like a broad spectrum where we're trying to be involved in a lot of aspects of the game, not just say one bit like bounty hunting or something, right? We want to have like a broad approach. And in that way, I think that it's going to, I mean, 
it, this is very subject to change. I think a proportionate amount is probably the most likely. What do you guys think about it? I, I think it has to happen in phases. This is just my take on it. Like if 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 you had said to me, mm -hmm. here is X amount of dollars for resources, and we're at phase one of Star Atlas, like three two three months ago, I would have probably done an equal allocation between Polis and and at and atlet or not polis but ships at that time the challenge with that is like for those of us that were invested in polis early on unless you maintain your holdings from from the pre-ido a lot of folks are upside down in in polis right now so there's a lot of weight to see how that does for you later on. The ships are doing great. The ships themselves as an asset class have gone up in value. So even if you got out of those ships, you're still doing well while the ships are also producing return. Um, but then that leaves that third bucket. I would approach it as land to me is a, is a big consideration. I consider that legacy within the, the Star Atlas metaverse because it's going to be one of those things, especially in safe zone, it won't ever be contested. Once you have it, it's legacy. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So uh, this week, the leaderboards, they were updated again so we could see all of the ships while they were staked. And that means uh, we have like a clearer view of how everything's going. Right, it's still uh, the same order as it was, but uh, yeah, MUD has a uh, huge uh, gap in assets from uh, even second place. 20 million is a huge number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, with, how is it, 4,000 less players, that's uh, quite impressive because that means they have uh, more per player. But in the grand scheme of things, all of these... Uh, three factions are going to be uh, earning the same amount it's uh so yeah and then it's, it's interesting how they've may have balanced out over time i mean you know it's between 200 million in assets you know you've been able to find people to pick a home between humans aliens and mm -hmm. and uh, ai you know <laughs> you know i look at those numbers a little bit differently it, i'm I'm suspecting that within Oni, there's a lot of scholars. I mean, we know we have mm -hmm. Tree, which has a lot of scholars brought with them. Yep. Uh, we, we know we have other guilds. MMA has probably some, maybe some scholars. Um, I know we have scholars. But, so there's a lot of scholars sitting in Oni. Um, and I'm wondering if the player base there is actually positioned better for Oni in the long run once scholars are needed to start playing assets. Because um, the disparity is interesting when you see such a high value in mud with a lower player count than you'd see in Oni. Right. I think it depends a lot on what the, the crafting model and, and how you'd be able to leverage mm -hmm. scholars and mm -hmm. what it will look like within a guild, a DAC, to be able to say, here's an asset, but we want these players to be able to utilize this asset. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a key ingredient to be able to allow people that aren't necessarily showing up with their own resources to be able to participate. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that I didn't get a chance to ask um, Casper and Dark Swoop is, is these these ideas of a guild as a business right. and, and knowing that Star Atlas is building DAC, the DAC framework within the game. I wonder how much Star Atlas is going to lean into the, the groups that are running a business to help support and create efficiencies for them. Or if they're just going to build it based on what the community is providing and this is what we want. Are they actually going to try to appease and, and bring in these gaming guilds? Well, I don't know if it was on the town hall or Ash's space afterwards, but somebody did raise a question during one of those two about members of the team that are currently involved with guilds, right? Mm -hmm. And the insinuation from that question is obviously, to be blunt, do they have an unfair advantage? Mm -hmm. Now, in the future, if they would like to collaborate with us, we'd be more than happy to. I'm sure mm -hmm. that a lot of guilds, would extend that same sentiment. I'm sure you guys would. It would be fantastic, mm -hmm. especially considering some of the team are already working with respective guilds, right? I would I personally like to see it, as there are already team members who are affiliated with guilds. 
I think, to then go to those guilds who don't have any kind of official connection and leverage their knowledge if they have to have it. That seems like a sensible compromise if there's the possibility of, and although they stress it, and I believe them, I believe that they will make every step that they can to protect information and keep it a level playing field. That's a good way to actually almost give an incentive to the guilds that don't have a team member and leverage their knowledge and let them work and contribute towards the project. I think it would give it more of a community feel, which is ultimately what they're striving for. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we didn't ask you earlier on, I'm curious as myself, like wh what kind of games were you into? Like what from a gaming perspective? Because I know that within the the MMA world over there, you're the guy closest to games. So like right. what was your jam? Like what, what did you play even as a kid? <laughs> Slightly different actually because often within our like, community members and guild members, you often get a lot of people that are into like MMORPGs and like turn-based mm -hmm. games. Personally, I was more into FPSs like Call of Duty and sports games like FIFA. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So actually, I've got a bit of a different background playing games to a lot of people. Um, but on, on the other side of that, my experiences of, in mainstream gaming communities are, are slightly different to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'd say that I'm possibly... Did I freeze for a moment then? Apologies. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. used to a different kind of... Uh, yeah, you guys are probably... If you, you said that you played uh, like World of Warcraft, yeah. You're mm -hmm. probably really exposed to that community feeling, right? Mm -hmm. That really, like when you play uh, in the other sports games and things like that you can often get a very different kind of community especially in 1v1 situations the toxicity in those kind of games for example <laughs> is massive i'll say that if there's anyone out there that recognizes me from it, they'll know that right they'll know that i find that really interesting though because of these kind of these are the kind of people i want to see in the next five years migrate into p2e i think for example some of the ea owned sports games where they have billions of dollars pumped into loot box style games. Right. The model of ownership where people could then withdraw their money back out instead of it being a one way <laughs> siphon into EA's pockets would be fantastic. <laughs> for the, it's a very blunt way of putting it, but there's opportunities for them to possibly even increase and expand their franchise's possibilities. What I found coming into, I've met a lot of phenomenal gamers actually um, mostly from turn-based games coming into... Uh, Axie's got a lot to do with that, I'd say. I feel like if the Genesis big boom game had been something different to Axie, we'd see people different to those kind of players that have risen to the top, you know. If you look at the top content creators in Axie, you can see that they've succeeded in part due to their knowledge of similar games. I'd be interested to see when a more diverse range of games is available in the next 12 months, what kind of other content creators and people will like start to get a chance to shine in their community. Because for some gamers, Axie's not their cup of tea. Art style, gameplay, whatever it may be. Peg Axie is a horse racing simulator. With one, it's not their cup of tea. I'd like to see what happens when people have a time to shine almost in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that will bring more people into the space when there's something that appeals to them. Right. I've tried to sell things like XE. It's a hard sell if people aren't interested in that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. So with a first-person shooter like Call of Duty, and especially the way it's evolved over the years, how do you how do you see that being implemented into play to earn? Is it like a team thing, like you know, capture the flag where the winner takes a pot? I mean, how do you how does that how would that work? I think if you look strictly at Call of Duty and the route they've taken in the last few years away from a loot box model. Mm -hmm. I think the ownership of the in-game skins for the guns, character skins, whatever it is, and have some kind of currency attached to them instead of a dollar value to the store. Right now, if you want to buy the most recent, uh, I'm trying to think of it in dollars, but if you want to buy the most recent operator skin with a gunner skin attached to it, you put £20 into the game, you get it, you own it. Yeah. So right. That's a one-way service. That's it forever. If they could have a system where you could have still have the option to buy it with US dollars, but you play a game, you earn a Atlas equivalent, 100 and you have to save up 10,000, 15,000. Fantastic. You have an option to buy said skin. However, what if somebody doesn't want it? You then have the option to sell that, that you've generated to somebody else who wants to. You're effectively doing the labor you're playing to earn. Yeah. It all comes down to how much of the pie does the developer and the publisher want to keep for themselves and if and why would they transfer to that model? yeah that's a good question and we're seeing like we're seeing some pushback like the ubisoft where people didn't like the ideas with them coming out with nfts we're seeing steam as a game company making a hard stance and saying we are not supporting any blockchain games on our platform 
Um, yeah, so it's interesting how everyone is starting to take a bit of a stance. And then the question that you know I, th I think still stands out there is if you have an ecosystem that's closed, what is your incentive for opening it up and making it more accessible to individuals to own their stuff unless the market demands it? And I think we're a mm -hmm. long way from the market necessarily demanding it, especially for those types of games. I think the only option, in my opinion, is necessity. You've hit the nail on the head there, really. The benefit to the player is immeasurable. If I sit down and play the most recent Call of Duty for X amount of time, but there is an option for me to some way recoup my time in money, that's amazing for me. Mm -hmm. Wow. I get to sell my skins, my, uh, my customization options, my reticles for a little bit of money when I'm finished in the game cycle. That's great for me. How does it benefit the publisher? How does it benefit the developer? Short answer is, well, the only option I can see is a marketplace tax, 5%. Mm -hmm. Perhaps mm -hmm. if they do some internal calculations and studies, perhaps that that transaction fee and still having the option to purchase them directly could make them more money, maybe. But I think it's going to have to be necessity. I think we're going to need to see projects like Star Atlas and many of us to come smash it out of the park. It almost start to become accepted and lean towards becoming the norm, mm -hmm. or something that's very normal. And then that way, perhaps we might start to see it integrated. But it's a money game ultimately, isn't it? It's about business. And if it doesn't suit them from a business point of view right now, they're not going to do it for our benefit. Right. Yeah, I, I see a lot of um, adoption being prolonged from the the inner fightings and and percentages that are going to have to take place between the uh, the creators. If there's going to be a whole conversation amongst the game developers, the you know uh, the the company itself, and then the player base not even wanting them. So does does that mean they go down that route? Do do, do they just force it through the door? You know, so there's too many turning wheels that need to kind of work together there, where most of those complications are dealt with. Uh, much easy, much easier here in the in the DeFi space when it comes to NFT gaming. Yeah, and I think uh, I've just seen a YouTube comment come through from Blah the Zombie saying that people are stuck on NFTs being uh, JPEGs and not utility based. Mm, yeah. This comment here, and I think that's another thing that will really come into bringing this into the mainstream or bringing the mainstream to us is actually knowledge and education about the utility of NFTs. It's purely anecdotal, but my experience from people I know or people I interact with on Twitter from mainstream gaming or otherwise, just people in general walks of life, the education is still quite lacking. People hear NFT, they either don't know what it is or they think of board Ape. Mm -hmm. If I tell them, actually, you can own a, a ship in this game that's going to be like this, they pricks there is and they're interested, but it's not what they think of first or even second. Mm -hmm. So that, that raises an interesting question. So... As the leadership of Rome, we've been giving some thought to, like, how would we want to go about making an NFT for within our guild? And we want to do it, in, it for a couple reasons. One is we want the commemorative aspect because we really are a community and we want to recognize people that have been a part of the community for some time. And, and, and also now in this infancy before we really have the ability to be boots on the ground as a guild within a game ver uh, world like Star Atlas, like what what are you what are your guys' thoughts on what some of the draws are for an NFT beyond being a you know a profile picture? Like what makes like we've seen some, some community Your mic is underwater. Yeah, uh, but one thing for me is uh, low supply. That's always a great indicator. Mm -hmm active team uh this is we've gone through this a bit <clears throat> uh what else do you guys think i would love to hear in the comments too yeah for sure 100 percent. i think ultimately when i think of utility i think that there's a lot of possibilities that haven't been explored yet but in my opinion i want something if i'm playing a game i like cosmetics and i like functionality like you've mentioned just there about what could the functionality and the utility of that be well there you go I've just seen the comment come up from the YouTube there. There's some fantastic suggestions coming in here as well. I know you're going to touch on the Snoop Dogg thing as well later, whether it be music creatively. I just want to give something that makes people feel unique and actually has an application. The other thing I'll say is, though, hopefully with the games, cosmetics aren't for everybody. There are plenty of people that play a game. Like I'll say straight up, I'll, you go back to my Call of Duty home base example. There are a lot of people that don't care about skins. They play the game to play the game. They'd much rather it be tied to something that has a function an actual in-game item 
uh, you know, and um, obviously yeah. then that comes back around to the pay to win argument we touched on a while ago. Utility but, is king. But yeah, exactly. I, I, what do you guys, what would your favoured utility be if you had one for your NFT if you end up producing it soon? In a dream scenario where there's no no restrictions, what ultimate utility are we going for? Well, quite an easy one would be uh, being able to like have an NFT to view like private live streams. If Twitch integrated that, that would be awesome. That's cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, Twitter's moving in that direction, so maybe other platforms will make it so that, yeah, you can re- uh, restrict access to certain content based on an NFT. My concern about restricting access as it relates to an NFT, though, is how does that work if that means anybody that has that nft whether they're a part of your group or not if they have the means to get that nft they just instantly have access to any any place within your guild so that that presents a challenge that i don't mm-hmm. personally know how to account for yeah it's tricky you know it's one of the things that we've uh, discussed before internally if you offer that for example you offer access to a private stream what if they break your terms of service or do something and you want to ban them Right. It's a strange example, but then you're in a paradox there. You've offered somebody unlimited access to something, mm-hmm. and then you mm-hmm. want to take it away immediately. How do you do that, though? Because right. the second that you have the autonomy to stop one person, it, there's a lot of things, and it's, uh, I'm pleased to see Twitter moving in a direction where they're embracing it, but there's a lot of questions for a lot of different offers to come up with. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge for access is transferability. It, it, you know, guilds need a close closed environment just by their very nature to avoid people understanding what they're going to do. And once you start using it to unlock channels or unlock rooms, all it takes is one person to either lose it, you know, or sell it or get pissed and just, you know, transfer it and, and open the door uh, to anybody else. So to me, NFTs within a guild are more um, about recognition and awards maybe whitelisting for future airdrops. Maybe there's a guild uniform that down the line you you build for the guild in, in Star Atlas and anyone who has that NFT is gonna get that uniform, those types of things. Yeah, yeah, great ideas. Uh, I think I might run through the last of the Star Atlas content so Ray can move on to Axie. So uh, we looked at this ship and uh, there was also this. Uh, we do know from previous pictures that it's the Fimble Lobby. Right. But there were some interesting guesses out there. <laughs> <laughs> Ronald, is that you? <laughs> My long lost friend. <laughs> yeah, we found this in the community. I thought it was quite funny. That's great. <laughs> also, this week there was Marble Photoli. That's how I'm calling them. Marble <laughs> Fish. I, like I haven't seen this one. Yeah, it looks really awesome. I like it. Like, yeah. uh, might not be Photoli, but um, aren't they supposed to be like beings of light? This looks yeah. quite solid. Mm-hmm. Good question. <laughs> the marketplace rolled out uh, just some simple UI changes. So uh, sell orders, buy orders. They changed the wording on that from ask and I uh, can't remember the other one, but it's a bit clearer now if you're using it for the first time. It also tells you the fee that mm-hmm. it requires. So another simply, another just nice thing they added. And uh, yeah, they also released this, which I really interested in more power yeah so when we see something like that does that mean that that's just going to be they're just showing us the mechanics of how they're building out 3d models of ships or is this to suggest that when you upgrade firepower and components on your ship that would be a module or component i think it's the latter i I think we know that there's going to be visible modules and components that attach to your ship that -hmm. looks like a hard point that they're demonstrating or building towards yeah what i find interesting so this is the pierce r8 if you look at like the cylinder and the wires below it uh, it's quite recognizable on the picture when i bring it up huh if you That's zoom it. in on the tank you can uh, see the piston and where it would be attached and i think it's quite interesting that all the like stock pictures we have now they are like kind of naked in a way they're gonna look much more beefed up when we have all of these uh things attached on right interesting yeah i like it yes yeah, big gun <laughs> yeah but and in all honesty it might not be uh because this isn't a fighter it's a fueler so it, it might just not be enough to protect itself 
or maybe just i don't think it's going to be you're going to need other ships with you around when you have this uh fueler coming out yeah uh, to, to I guess, uh, it's not going to hold its own in, in by any means i, I don't think it's got a jod asterisk in the background and you can see that which is uh also oh uh, yeah textured in the engine that's well, right without texture i mean uh, yeah solid stuff still waiting to see more on this one it isn't the picture that we looked at previously it's just the different design you right. can uh, tell straight away when you look at it still we're thinking that that's a possibility that that's a drone still potentially maybe yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay. this the other one has more of a booster at the back which uh makes it a little more simplistic compared to this one yeah yeah and uh that was pretty much it yeah sweet you know there was something else that i i think is worthy of discussing and, and maybe theory crafting about what it's going to be but they acknowledged there was going to be new incentives for atlas coming up soon I, i'm not quite sure if it was a staking piece or yeah they have to talked about a different way they've talked about a single side single-sided atlas staking in the past and i think uh that's getting closer to being rolled out they're also uh doing uh optimize optimizing the mobile user interface so uh you'd be able to play score on your phone with the uh, ios wallet phantom and uh android is coming soon yeah so so most single-sided staking mechanisms are really just a fair distribution process right it's a way to get more tokens out into the space have they said anything about that? Does anybody know more about what they plan to do? Not here. Uh, no. Time will tell, I guess. All right. Yeah, and there was a there was a really interesting quote from Wagner as well when he was talking about the showroom. So you'll be able to view your assets at scale. Mm. There will be some exploration, and uh, it's quite a large map that you can explore. A uh, great environment for various communities to have their own town halls or guild meetings. So it seems like it's going to be a bit more dynamic than just uh, like a see your NFT yeah. and uh, buy, which is really good. So they intend to have it multiplayer upon release. So that means you will be able to what, roam around and have, you know, the second life ID combos one? and chat with people. Yeah, they're aiming for that. Aiming but for uh, yeah. uh, if, uh, if it's not available at launch, then it'll be like a single player and multiplayer will be like a future functionality yeah like uh, i wonder sure for it, sure you know if it's multiplayer by by nature of it being multiplayer you have to have all the characters finished as well right including the sizes the clothing the skins um, you can't just have a bunch of stick avatars running around so sure. is that a, a selection process then so once right, you select right your avatar so to speak is that are you committed to that is that now on chain can you swap between races mm -hmm. yeah i'm curious what that will look like if that has to be in place uh in time mm -hmm. so uh yeah that's all the notes from uh star Atlas this week do we want to move on to uh snoop dog quickly before uh yeah. Maxi? <laughs> sure. this is good. this is gonna be a long conversation <laughs> you want to take this one Partially painful conversation. So, yeah. I mean, the, the backstory for people is that Gala Games, who now has about nine or ten games uh, in their arsenal, are have decided to branch out into Gala Music. And so now their marketing is positioning why music is a complement to games and vice versa. And so out of the box, <laughs> the stash box here, is is uh, their deal with Snoop. And that's in addition to Snoop, it, so it sounds like they're also doing stuff with Steve Aoki and and uh, probably have some others lined up. But uh, yeah, this is a tricky one. $5,000 for a box. I don't know. Does that get you a song? Because there's mm -hmm. like an album of like 17 songs total. Yeah, what do we know about this other than the fact that there's 25,000 available at 5,000 a pop, which is like 130 million, something like that. So, so here's my best understanding. You know, there's an album that's being released. It's 17 songs. Um, three of the songs are exclusive to Gala. Ownership does not mm -hmm. mean you get royalties. These songs can still play on Spotify. Mm -hmm. um, so really what you're doing is you're hoping 
um, that you stake this NFT into their now launched music network or upcoming launched music network, which they're also selling node licenses for. Um, and oh. every time this song gets played, if you own it, you get 3.5 cents per song when it's played. So if you think about the, you know, they refuse to accept the word investment, which is a bunch of bullshit. But if you think about the investment of this, you know, you're going to spend $5,000 and it's going to take how many, play you're not the only person who owns this <laughs> NFT. Right. Right. So how many plays is it going to get take to get your return back? And then to add further insult to um, a critical yes, mind. Yes, injury. We are injured. Yeah, yeah. Is <laughs> the nodes, they, they're not saying how many nodes they're going to sell, right? And right. they're not giving the tokenomics of their Gala Music coin. So th Holy there's shit. so much just absolute trust that you have to provide this company that this is going to be something um, that's going to be beneficial to you. But in their words, you're supporting the net. You're, you're supporting right. the, the spirit of what they're doing, right? Right. Mm, it's a, so it's a boom this is a good comment by Punjab. Sale is over today. Rest is burnt. So, how many owners are there now? When you took this screenshot, there were just under two thousand. So, I'm curious how many there will be before the burn. Mm, not sure, but uh, unlimited notes yeah. because they're going to release more songs, I assume, and mm. different artists and uh, listen to own. So, so the potential for it long term, like I could see how things like this could be a success um i just i just see i just think that it's too i don't I, like this the sales of it all and how it's presented and and with with the frequency of just the different projects that are presented you know maybe there's just that ultimate mastermind behind it that that we, maybe we can't grasp the, the the whole picture here but i've got a few questions if you guys could enlighten me <laughs> sure uh, Per play, we've just discussed how much. On what platform is that being played? Gala Music, which is yep. basically the nodes that you're hosting. And each play, they've said, is the equivalent of $0.10 cents USD. And exclusively just that platform? Yes. But that's they're not limited to that platform. Again, right. if, if people want to go to Spotify and hear that album, right. that completely bypasses the Gala Music network. What's What's the incentive to someone to come to Gala Music instead of Spotify or YouTube? That's yeah. the question. That's I don't, I don't know that question. there is a draw. And then there's I'll also audience. That clip onto them. You know, there's people <laughs> in the space that are blockchain, like Audius. That, so there's other music plays in the space as well that have like that's their main focus. So it's not like they decided to do, you know, hamburgers and car seats. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I, I don't know what the draw is. I'm curious to know. Well, and now yeah. we now we're in a position where we've got a, a game developer who is selling NFT upon NFT, one real working game, one that's almost about to launch, and they're spreading themselves into music. And I'm going to make a guess that they're going to spread themselves into media, um, and potentially the, something showed up in their. Um, gala gold sneak peeks that i won't talk about but it made absolute no sense to me it's a it's another industry that a game developer has no business getting into so it just seems like they're they want to print nfts for whoever they can and rake in the money and not do anything for it that's my impression yeah and as i already mentioned uh, the other day that i was doing a little bit of homework on the amount and if we exclude the one playable game which is townstar and we exclude the high the nft sales of miranda so we took those two out there's still over 900 million dollars in marketable nfts across all their other games games that aren't even playable yet so that's insane of a number but i was just thinking do we see other artists flocking to gala music um to do the same thing snoop dogg has done and is does this get rid of the middleman is this a real true decentralized way for artists to to claim their their sovereignty back <laughs> you know from from the middleman taking all the profits well the the, the the payout for the music the musicians is not bad it's five cents per play which is far better than they'll get on spotify right but mm -hmm. i just don't think they have the the people there to get the volume of plays that they need to make the good money and just for in fairness to Gala Music, some of the other artists are um, Snoop Dogg, Steve Aoki, 
um, Kings of Leon, Maroon 5, Base Jackers, mm-hmm. which we know from Star Atlas. So they are drawing, drawing in some talent, but I, I'm, I mean, they're going to, people are going to print Gala to buy Gala music tokens to spend it on a Gala locked universe or a locked node system. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, in theory, I like the idea of supporting the artists more. Mm-hmm, I do. Mm-hmm. I, I, I already pay nine ninety nine for a Spotify subscription. Right. Um, other than the pull of supporting the artists more and the people that own the nodes, I'd be really interested if they could provide some information as to what other reason I would migrate. And how many plays, artists. how many songs a month do you think you listen to, Dark? Me? On, on Spotify? Uh, probably about just over 200. Okay, 200. So we're talking $20 a month. Yeah. Um, you would pay for Gala at 10 cents a play, right? So there's they have to do better than 9.99 a month if they want to draw people over. And and right now the economics aren't there. Yeah. And as I already mentioned, while I don't know the model, there is already plays in this space like Audius. I don't know their mm-hmm. model, but I know that that the concept is again trying to look for a, a decentralized model where the artist gets compensated more for their their work, their content. So yeah, I don't. I wish they would explain more about what they think they bring to the table that is missing. What are they solving for? Yeah. Well, I, I don't. Well, they're solving for their their checkbook the is books. what I think they're solving for. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I did the math, and it, I think the node was twelve hundred dollars. And if you didn't stake any NFTs in, in, into it, node holders get ten percent of every song that's played. So each song is ten cents. You get one penny for every play as a node holder, but the nodes are unlimited. They haven't talked about how many there are. So if you at 10,000 nodes, which is very conservative for Gala, right? I mean, they're, they're shooting their founders nodes up into 30,000. It's like 1.2 billion plays just to make your money back. It it just doesn't make any sense. But doesn't, and I, did I read this right? That the transaction though, that takes Mm -hmm. place, actually the transaction is compensated to the founders node network somehow did i read that correctly somewhere i think they said they were doing it temporarily until they get the music network up mm. founders you know that's just a distribution system for gala in my opinion they're getting screwed left and right by gala what else we got fancy uh well it's race turn really if he wants to go over that too. you got uh, some maxi stuff for us yeah, I got some action stuff for you. All right, Dark Scoop. He's he's actually savvy. He can weigh in here as well. Yeah, sure yeah. Oh, yeah. I pulled this <laughs> together. Yeah, for sure. It's gonna be cool. Uh, the latest update has been the release of lots of uh, content on Origin V3. So that's pretty exciting. And I'm just gonna go. I'm gonna run through some of the artwork before we get to uh, what actually is taking place with the with the release of uh, actually Origin v3 so here we can see there's a plethora of information and details to speculate on but also that are explained to us in the in the in the article and there's great youtube videos that cover and also theory craft on what we don't know yet but it's just a great picture to look at right so we're gonna have our new cards that are coming out with ears and i uh ears and and uh, eyes so we're gonna have some effects and different cards including dawn and and dusk so that's great so i'm just going to pull through these and we'll get to a list at the end and you know by all means comment on how lovely this all looks in your eyes if you if you like if you like no pressure no pressure (laughs) yeah for you as well dark soup you have anything that stands out to you from any of these just i think I i mean i think the art style change as long as yeah. it's taken, I really like it actually. I was a little bit worried when I uh, spoke about it a week ago, and then I went on to actually chat just before all this stuff was released. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a good update. If you think about how, in the time that they've had to do this in relation to what they've done, yeah, it's good. Right. I'm more when it comes down to it. For example, if you got one of the screens where the axes are actually uh, in sure. play, damn. So what I'm really interested in is one of the first notes in the Substack is about the sequential turns that are coming in, yeah, mm-hmm. and the new fast pace. I do think that the style and the art style of the design does suit that a lot, and I think it will make uh, there's a lot of room to maneuver on that as well. Yeah. 
for sure. Um, yeah, what do you, what do the rest of you yeah. guys that have maybe not seen this before think? Is there uh, not outsiders, but people looking at it fresh? I'm, I'm just going to withhold my comment because I'm not a big fan of Axie, but <laughs> the art's cute. A <laughs> 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 one. Yeah. So uh, I'm the, the biggest proponent for Axie here uh, in Rome. So just for the record, if those are, are watching from MMA or just in general, whoever joined recently Rome. And so here's just a compiled list. And I can kind of breeze through and do a, a condensed form of Axie updates here when there could be a, a whole long form as well. That's done with, I'll throw out Axie chat, you know, kudos to them. Shout out. They uh, do a great job on um uh, and MMA was recently on Axie Chat as well, so you could always check them out if you're if you're if you know about Axie Chat, you could go to their Discord or their Twitter. And um, yeah, so here's a list that we could just breeze through just to mention it. And if you could always uh, s screenshot or pause the video if you're watching, but these are some of the one of the many things that uh, are going to be taking place. So we got three free axes. So now you're going to have people able to play with free axes to get used to and get comfortable or try it out, test it out, and then potentially buy in their own team. That's a much better team, I guess, than you'll get that are free to play. So, so those three to uh, free to play just get you in the game and you get your ass handed to you the whole time? Is that kind of what happens? <laughs> well, not well, not necessarily. You could be playing adventure mode, right? So we'll, we'll have true. adventure mode. And that's going to be a, a whole experience in itself. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, as it's going to be updated and it'll probably be uh it, you'll be ha having your your led by your hand playing the game to understand more um so that's going to be a pretty good to yeah. sell more people on axie infinity I, de I definitely believe that they're going to focus them the builds more on pve yeah i'm pretty sure it would be a bad incentive to give people a a, a really strong pvp team as by default and let them <laughs> run havoc on people that have spent quite a considerable amount of money i have a feeling it's going to be mostly <laughs> right yeah, for for sure. the AI. but it, i like it as a concept it's a good change yeah so just you know no slp or axs in origin alpha stage so it's just going to get people acclimated to what's going on without the earning potential blinding them and uh, so that's just going to be great. And then we got Battle V2, which is the current, what we know of as the Battle Arena system. Uh, maybe shut down in Season uh, season 0 of Origin uh, Battle V3. So mid-season, uh, mid we'll, for Season 20 of the Arena mode, we might see some change taking place. So prepare yourselves. And uh, so we got Battle V3 cards played immediately. No delay in turns, like uh, Dark Suit mentioned earlier. We'll see how that goes. Uh, as they did increase the speed of the animations... Not increase the speed. They more or less lined it up because there was a delay. So mm -hmm. that's what technically happened. But it seems like it's sped up. Aside from them being on the ground now versus hovering. Uh, yeah, energy and cards reset every round. So no more card saving and uh, saving energy and cards. So I guess that contributes to the, the, to the play speed. Um, most cards will be either attack or defense, not both. Uh, so eyes and ear cards will now have value. All six part cards have have use now, which is going to be amazing. There's going to be such an amount of different combinations to to be had with the uh, cards and, and different teams. What do you guys think about the? Uh, well, yeah, I'll just continue going. Uh, stop but, me if you have an opinion. I I just, I, there were two parts that weren't functional, right? All right. And so yeah, that, what we're now is so basically another fifty percent of that of the you know is factored in for those two new parts. Pretty That's much. substantial. Yeah, I mean, that yeah. that changes gameplay, and it probably also changes the value of whatever spec you're running now for your teams. Right. It's going to definitely throw a wrench in the, in the machine of what people think are meta teams, because you might have two out of the six body parts that are favorable yeah. to be something of a different class that just work better synergistically. Yeah, you might. Well, yeah, go ahead. I was saying, being that uh, you guys at MMA, you run quite a few teams. Have you? What is what has been the impact mm. now that you have these additional variables thrown in the mix? I'm hoping actually that it'll bring. We've got a we we up until the point it became unfeasible, uh, we used to breed a lot, if not all of our axes. And as mm -hmm. a byproduct of that, we've got a lot of. Uh, well, we were using them for energy axes instead of selling them for the longest time. We've got a lot of very uh, funky creations going on with mixed body parts and stuff, and mm -hmm. bringing value to those parts it's fantastic oh, i think that's another really good change we could probably find a lot of value in mm. some pretty oddball combinations there 
Yeah. Um, and to the point previously about the changes in the gameplay system, that's where I am still personally mulling it over and reflecting on it. I believe that the, the lack of delay, bringing the energy, you're removing aspects of strategy for me. Mm -hmm. And I am interested to see how that plays out. On the other side of the equation, I do see it as just a new kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. Right. And the community sentiment around stalling tactics of old that <laughs> relied a lot right. on. I mean, on a personal level, I'm not upset by that at all. That's fine with me. I'd rather not play a game that goes to uh, 15 mm. turns and we end up having HP chipped away at the end. Right. I'd much rather. That is just in my opinion. When, uh, But generally, th there's a lot of changes here, though. That's the thing I'd like to really like uh, anyone from MMA that's watching. We went through such a barren spell of not having anything. And in fact, I believe I spoke to you guys last week about saying that I wanted to see more changes. And yeah. suddenly we get this dropped on us out of nowhere <laughs> after the leaks that we had on Axie Chat on Wednesday. Time. Right. With it's the power to digest. Of... Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there is there, there's that tug of war and push and pull of what's going to not be what everyone's used to. And then, you know, again, getting acclimated to the new style. So you might not maybe go to round 21, depending on the cards and how they're used. But there's going to be something that's exciting that people come to like uh, after they continue playing. Yeah, so, I like it. Uh, but definitely the value that's added to our axes are going to be great with those eyes and ears. I like really like that part. Uh, so uh, then we just got power going down the list here with my cursor. You got power up axie abilities with runes and charms. So these are just going to be things that uh, are going to be added to power up your axes uh, in, in battle and and charms alike, and then we need to earn moon shards to craft runes and charms. So there's that that gamification of runes and charms, where moon shards uh, are the ones that are able for you to craft runes and charms. Non NFT wearables that increase axie ability. So these are not going to be these are off chain, and they won't be able to be traded or sold. Hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, and you know speculation around that. Can you can you save them and then use them even if there's a rotation of different charms and craft runes. Uh, I would do some talk about there not there being different type of charms and craft runes. For like, uh, so they they'll go out of style, but then there's going to be a new set that you could create uh, craft with your moon shards. So would you still be able to use the ones that are that fell out of uh, popularity because now there's been a change, and still if you just harvest and made a whole bunch of them. So that was one of the questions I had while I was going through this. Uh, and then to craft more powerful NFTs, uh, NFT-based runes and charms, you need moon shards plus SLP. So now we've got that. Uh, this is the, the first sign of an additional sync here for SLP, where you're going to have to incorporate or use them together with moon shards, and then you can create a more powerful charm or rune uh, for your axiom. Um, so each new season, old uh, what the <laughs> renewals and charms would be removed, uh, and you need to to basically, uh, yeah, hunt. pretty much hunt for <laughs> hunt for new ones. Uh, so, so continuing on, unused moon shards also expire each season. There you go. So that answered my question. And uh, so most of most of these, I, I, I gotta imagine. So like for me, even though that I have. I've played Axie Limited. I have scholars in Axie. I've been a part of the project just from a micro investment standpoint. Like, what would you say the bulk of these changes mean? Not only to the person, like there's there's people listening that are familiar with Axie more than I am that are like, oh, this is cool and this is awesome. But for the person outside of the project, what do these changes really mean? And are they are they going to light up the project and bring back some of what made Axie great? Well, the next two points on the list, uh, where it goes on to say no more random critical hits and simplified stats with faster gameplay. Mm -hmm. Turner speed, which <laughs> yeah, there's another type. Of speed points have no value, only HP hit points. Right? What you're seeing along with the things about to do with battle on the left-hand side is there's been a lot of simplification. Mm -hmm. And how people in the community react to that, I am not sure. I personally would have preferred more strategies as opposed to less. And like I say, I'm happy to be proven wrong. But when you take away stats and change the effects of cards, the card change, just to elaborate on it, they're going to be 
changing what the, the function is. They're either going to be mostly, as it says there, attack or defense. I would expect right. if you took it, if you looked at the project in isolation, normally with turn-based card games, you'd expect the change over time to be more features and more like calculations and numbers and variables, not backtracking right. to one or the other. This is a simplification to me. They've taken away critical hits is one of those things. There was a stat allocated to that um, on the face value of the cards. Do people like it? Depends. I I don't mind if it's gone. Randomness is one of those things. I, I don't think it has a a place in esports and competitive acting that's really not, not something i think should be in there but again it's just another thing where they've streamlined the experience starter yeah. x's now as well mm -hmm. people are going to get introduction to the game they have a chance to access and play it that's good when the price of slp was and it was for the last six weeks was anyone struggling to get a scholarship i'm not sure it's good right. i'll give them credit they've put a lot of changes or they're planning to implement a lot at once quite a brave move by the team the aspects about crafting the runes and charms and then having to do it again each season and stuff that's a good cycle that will keep people playing that's a good one of those like positive little cycles that you do each season each season new rooms new charms new crafted doesn't carry over but I've just seen there as well where they don't carry over after each season. Is that does that reward people? I don't know. What's well, the yeah, I'm thinking from just an initial question, it technically will become more fun. If there's going to be more things for you to do, which is this rotation of crafting, it adds that extra, you know, thing to do, which could increase your chances of winning. And if, if you're winning to play and earn, then there you go. Right. So, and then if you take part in arena mode, there's just going to be more to do. And along with the updated art, it's it could be appealing to, to more people, uh, you know, prior to just it being the way it was, and then people just not yeah. liking the art. Maybe this is an upgrade, uh, an, uh, an upgrade on the art. So maybe now it appeals to those who thought the art was was crap, you know, in a different way than just it being colorful and not um, in that way. So if it's more fun, which they always talk about the team wanting to make the game, then this this might be the right the right move that they're that they've been planning all along to get more people interested. Yeah, I guess to answer Jesse's earlier question in two sections now, I've discussed it out loud and heard your thoughts. I think the game's going to be more fun to play. I mm -hmm. think it's going to be more fun to look at and as an experience. So as a game, yeah. exclusively as a game, good. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a P2E game, I'm not sure. And I right. don't mean that in like a, it's not going to happen. I mean, I just need to see what happens. Exactly. I don't see anything to sway my opinion either way here. And that's that's the thing. You can't really sway anyone's opinion unless this is actually implemented fully to, to, to the extent that they're going to release it. And then we see that uh, essentially that new economy grow <laughs> or, or the changes of the economy take place to see what all happen, how the, how the cards fall. I would have expected perhaps a single extra SLP burn mechanism in there, considering the amount of changes. Yep. yep. That's For one sure. thing I think is absent. However, having discussed it the other day on actually chat, the summary of what the conclusion we came to is they've recently done the testing mechanism for burning axes and gifting them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I assume if it was in a completely functional state, they would have put it in here. So I imagine it's probably still under development. Yeah. There's no reason for them to choose not to put it there. Exactly. And because it's, it's already a successful test with well over a hundred thousand burned axes. Um, I think that that's just going to be automatically incorporated as a, a way to maybe, you know, get a more powerful charm it could be a, a something next to an slp plus a moon shard option yeah. uh to mm. get a more powerful or different um different uh charm for an understanding or, of scale like what percentage of axes was that is that like a quarter of a percent how many axes are there if you burned a hundred thousand what is the impact well i'm thinking there's over six hundred thousand on the market or it got knocked down a hundred thousand plus uh mm -hmm. since the initial release i think it was over like $22 million worth of axes, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's in the range of a double digit, you know, uh, you know, uh, millions worth. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's people want to use their axes for something else. And this just proves, uh, that even with no utility on these items yet, because they're land items that you're receiving for sending your axes to the, to the death camps, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, or releasing, you know, 
play on the words. <laughs> Uh, but hey, there was all the speculation that these these axes that are being sent to a specific wallet address are going to be used for the for, for the play to earn the free the three free to play axes that people would would be using. So uh, the more you burn and the more di and the, the different utilization for burning axes in the future will just roll over into providing more free to play axes for people. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, hand helps hand, I guess, but we'll see how many people are in the, we'll see how, how much demand there is for people using the free to play axes. And then, you know, if they don't play, what happens if it was the case that you're using those, those uh, axes that were sent on a journey. So, uh, yeah, so it's pretty cool. All the, lots of, lots of things to look forward to. And then here we just have the full article um, that you can check out. It's just, uh, this is a uh, season 20 is live now. This mm -hmm. is uh, on their Twitter. You can just check that out. And with that, we have uh, it's six weeks long, so I think it's the longest running. Uh, and uh, it starts February 9th and then onwards to March 22nd. So within that time, you'll have uh, close to $7 million worth of rewards that get distributed to the top, what was it now? 300,000? Yep. So top 300,000 players. Mm -hmm. So, if, so ranging from the top first, the uh, first first uh, place to three hundred thousandth place, and that I range like of it. reward, yeah. And to, that, to be fair to them, although they can be diluted a bit at the bottom, it is a generous pool. That is a very generous for a six week period. Sure, that's good. It's a good incentive to get people uh, up there, and I hope that we help to see a lot of guilds encouraging their players to work hard and get up there and keep everything that they earn themselves. Absolutely, it's a, it's a really good incentive. So, so I have a question for, for you guys, uh, especially, you know, the the two of you that are very familiar with, with Axie on a daily basis. Yeah. What is the impact of of others that come into the space? Like, obviously, one that's gathered a lot of attention recently is Pig Axie. And it seems like they're doing a lot of things right, and as in they paid attention to what was happening in the space, the successes of Axie. And then they came forth with their own burn mechanism and the way that they do things. Does that support the space overall? Does it take away daily active users from Axie? What's the impact of new players coming in the space? I'm going to try and give you a very detailed answer very quickly on that. Awesome. Peg Axie coming into the space, it's very apparent to me that the leadership team and the management structure there learned a lot of lessons from Axie. Mm -hmm. Right. I would really like to see Axie continue to then in turn learn from what they're executing. Yeah. That competition could turn out to be fantastic for their economy if they learn in return that way. Two, Axie, I think ideally some of the changes we had last week and discussed, they want to reduce the amount of SLP being minted. Right. In a strange way, if people, a small amount of players migrate to a different game, that's ultimately reducing the amount of SLP being minted which is a good thing for Axie's economy. There can be too much of a good thing. Too many people... I, I you, You've only got to look at the trajectory of Axie's economy in a year. I don't think they accounted for the amount of people that ended up playing it. Mm -hmm. It would have been... It's an incredible achievement by the team, but probably far beyond what they've accounted for. Mm -hmm. And more games coming into the space is more lessons to learn. And perhaps while Axie still continues to adjust and fix its economy, it's just another way to reduce the amount of SLP being minted. Actually, still got a phenomenally popular backbone there on social media and Twitter. <laughs> there are a lot of Axie Maxies that are in this for the long run, man. Like their community is not going anywhere quickly. So things coming onto the space, yeah, lessons to be learned and opportunities to get maybe just a little less SLP minted. Yeah. Any any thoughts as to uh, what the what the chain as a whole is going to do and what the future of of, of uh, the Ron token? And, you know, what are they doing there? Is there, is there any new alpha, anything that's sitting out there that you guys have heard? Well, uh, uh, not technically with Ron specifically, but the, the, the bigger picture here with what they're accomplishing with the release of it is that they're going to put on some, some, uh, some interesting IPs, uh, projects that want to build on top. And they're very, they can be very selective here and not need to worry and pick and pick who they want. That's going to be a, uh, that which is going to be a success right out the gate like so they have the money they have the attention they have everything they mm -hmm. need and it they could take the time which i would recommend they do to just really flush out and and get some some project building on that we might all well all well know is a popular game from the traditional space yeah to then just blow everything out the water you know like gala mm -hmm. games it's hard to not pay attention to them 
whether you like them or not because of just what they're doing. Yeah. So and the names that are coming on, like Walking Dead, Snoop Dogg, from all the different angles. So if you know Axie is focusing on just games as a game development, um, then they're gonna be the best at that, I believe. You know, yeah. there'll be competition, but. As as Dark Swoop mentioned, the, it, I think it's great if they are also paying attention to improvements that have been made yeah. outside of the space. They now have this chain; they've got this platform, and so and they're they're they've got a nice wad of cash sitting there. So it'd be pretty cool if we saw some great projects, whether mm -hmm. through acquisition or through partnership, find their way to the Ronin chain, and they learned from some of the things like you know like what. Peg Axie's doing with their rental program versus me having to pay scholars and go that route. So if they take the best of what people are discovering in this space through trial and error and observation, and then take some really cool games that are fun to play and put that on on chain on on Ronin, I think that'd be a, yeah. That's, that's my best hope for what Axie will do yeah. uh, news wise within 2022. Right. For for as long as I can remember, they always said that it wasn't on the top of their list as it was a surprise that it blew up scholarship programs the way they did. So yeah. what they did was provide scatter, which is a part of the, the release of the, of Ronin where you can pay in bulk all of your scholars by just adding their addresses. So it was a nice tip of the hat to, you know, we recognize the community and the demand that they want or that they're calling for to help the scholar managers and the guilds to, to make it easier because we saw a lot of innovation and discord bots being created by devs to just have this easily done within the Discord where scholars can write a command and then get paid out their share uh, by percentage. So uh, it, it was almost like the community was ahead of the game in development than Sky Mavis mm -hmm. was uh, with Axie Infinity to help guilds. But again, it was, they, wrote, they were vocal for as long as I've been in the project since you know October 2020 uh, before scholarships were, were even a thing that it wasn't um, something they ever were planning to, to do like Peg Axie did so but sure enough I'm sure as time goes on we're going to have similar situations in games just like DeFi Kingdoms you could rent out you know Fancy Burns you could rent out Peg Axie rent out so it's just a natural evolution I think that's hey, look, this, this is all part of the process isn't it and it's kind of what uh, we just touched on with Peg Axie right they didn't yeah. plan to have the scholarship model in October 2020 but they ended up having it right. Peg Axie has now implemented something which is an almost seamless effort if we can see something like that before 2023 in Axie, that would just be unbelievable. Hell yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely. And then that's an example of competition coming into the space and actually benefiting both parties involved. Yep. And that's and, something I'd love to see continue. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Because why wouldn't they, what, they're just going to grow off of everyone getting pumped on the scholarship program and then ignore them completely after the fact? You know, that's that's the majority of the, of the population of, of what made Axie. So they're not just going to forget about them. It might take a little while. They might get rid of the mercenaries, as Jihost calls them, instead of the missionaries. <laughs> and and they're going to just not see a return and get out and move on. And that's technically not what you would want for any project you're a part of, especially if you have members of a guild. You wouldn't want those mercenaries in your guild just to be around, knowing that that's all they care about. You know, so, you know, it goes goes both ways. But just moving on here, we've got the Phil... Phil Law from Niantic, who is a developer on Pokemon Go, he just was onboarded. That was a, a big, um, on, you know, back on February 7th. And uh, so today we welcome the new game product lead, Phil Law, to the team. And Scott Mavis will oversee product management of Origin and Land, as well as uh, the overall Axie Infinity economy and game roadmap. So you can check out his thoughts on this particular. So if you go back on the Axie Infinity page, I uh, invite people to do that so they'll get a better idea about Phil. And, you know, that since this was announced, we had a plethora, again, of just information and expect that to continue because that's just the way it needs to be moving forward. You can't go backwards or else, you, you know, it's not going to be looking good. And last but not least, I think that was it. Yeah. So other than that, it's looking OK for Axie, in my opinion. And I'm excited for this uh, Origin Vs 3 to actually be a thing to play. My last question about, about Axie there is like, um, what do you think it was about the mechanic of this new season that actually gave like what it almost looked like a 300% pump in SLP price from its all time, not all, I guess all time low within the past month or so, at least when it was down under sub one cent. And now it popped back to what, three and a half or three somewhere around there? Yeah. Uh, it was sad about, yeah, it was. 
just under three cent when I checked it before we came on. Um, I think the confidence in the project, I think a big boost, but I monitored this up until Wednesday when I had a big air thing on AxiChat, right? There was actually no discernible reason for it to go up other than mm. goodwill in the project. But that kind of speaks for itself. That was a big jump, a big jump at a time when the burn rate was still uh, very low in comparison to the mint. That was a big jump. And then most of that, I believe, is like I just said, come down to confidence in the project and a renewed sense of optimism. I don't really see any other reason right now other than that to be the case. People are driving the price up again for the first time in God knows how long because they see it having further utility. And that was what drove it to that crazy peak back in July, early August, wasn't it? Is people buying it to do breeding and seeing utility in the token and wanting it to have it because they see the future it could have. I'm interested yeah. to see what you think if there's actually a, a reason for it in game, Ray, because I'm not totally convinced there is right now. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, it's but it the, the history proves that if there's more utility, then there's more activity and there's more interest. Yeah. So if we're just going off the basis of that, all technically that needs to take place are implementations and releases of more sinks. You know, if it's one by one in the span of, you know, and over the course of a year, you only get three more sinks. You have to let those actually f like flush out and and be used and to see. And it's all these. It's a trial and error period for sinks. Some sinks won't even work. Some people might not want to use their SOP to do anything for runes and crafting, and they'll they'll just sell out continually, as they have been. Um, but then you won't reap the rewards of earning more SOP if you don't utilize the the runes, maybe strengthen your axes. So it's like a it's it's the balancing act as a developing team to to get the economy you know running again, <laughs> and then also as yeah. a player to 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 put in work as they said to earn more you know it's a skill-based type of game or uh, uh this is this era of gaming is transitioning very fast to yeah. skill-based playing so it's it's it, that's all it comes down to where it's just like you'll earn more from being a better skilled player from pay, to paying attention and spending more time in the games like we talked about earlier when casper was here uh those those esport gamers you're gonna pick a game stick to it and that's your job you know what i'm saying yeah now that the price is is kind of like uh, I would I wouldn't say stabilize this, but what now that's do you think it will eventually stabilize sub ten cents, or do you think that it will ever again see an all time high comparable to where it was, or is that just a spike while it was finding itself? There's a few landmark occasions if you think about it, and this is like a pure speculation on my part. But obviously, they want to transition the project into full three D. We want to see land. Uh, be incorporated in the mini games and the projects like that. There's a possibility, but what they need to achieve that is a reason for people to buy it. Mm -hmm. And there are a few in the future. I think there's a few chances that could happen. I see a stable price for SLP because it could be controversially low, but I <laughs> see it as being sustainable at around five or six cents. I think if you convert that, I think that's a good amount for the amount of time it takes to play. And I think it's stable and solid and realistic. Right. And there are plenty of people who have managed to really force themselves to go through if they're playing purely for the money at just over a cent, a cent, or slightly less than. Five or six is a good stable number. I don't yeah. see why not. I mean, I think a lot of people would be happy. Mm -hmm. I'd yeah. be happy. Yeah, when it comes to the amount of sinks, so I'm thinking you over the course of time of the development and release of sinks and the different types of them, there's going to be a finite amount of sinks. There can't be an infinite amount unless from Axie Infinity itself. Uh, but the mini games. What, what do you mean by sink? I'm, I'm lost sink, on that sink word. Sink is uh, another mean. way to burn SLP. So there's an over okay. over minting of SLP, and that was the, the, the biggest problem. And then now there's going to be sinks or burning mechanism in, implemented. Uh, so it get, removes more SLP as it's coming in, and that, that balance takes place. So now there's a less, you know, or an in increase, if you want to call it, as there's an unlimited supply of SLP, the team, again, as long as I've been in the project, always said it's a utility token for breeding purposes only. So, you know, as the as the run-up with Scholars came in to be, everyone's attention is SLP, Binance puts it on, everybody, you know, it's a, the whole rave happened. But I'm thinking, outside of the mini games that are going to be those additional burning mechanisms for SLP, along with AXS, Sky Mavis as a game, cannot just continually if they want to sure but i'm thinking in my opinion they should have successful burning mechanisms 
at a at a certain amount. They're, they're, it's not going to be necessary for them to co- constantly create, um, unless the ones they do, as far as burning SLP, are successful ones. And um, so, because at what point d- does it end for creating the amount of sinks? Right, two years, five years from now, we're going to have thirty different ways to burn SLP. Like it doesn't make any sense. There's going to have to be a finite amount that just keep everything in house in the game itself and that are successful to equalize the burning and the minting of SLP. So that's just yeah, a, it's a good explanation. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, yeah, but that was pretty much it for a- uh, AXS, Axes, SLP, and the whole nine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, with that, I don't know if we have any more news. Uh, in the past, we've covered uh, Alluvium. We've talked a bit about DeFi Kingdoms. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what Alluvium is going to do this year. I think that it's one of those projects that has had such a tremendous amount of support. I think it's due in part to their unusual approach to tokenomics. Um, But they haven't really had that and the way that they share the development cycles and process with their community. They seem Mm -hmm. to have done well there. But how long can you ride that before you actually have to say, look, now we're about to show something. And I know they have some things on the horizon. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what they're going to do. Um, aside from that, you have, you've heard to mention a couple times of peg at some point, uh, maybe in the next show or the show thereafter, uh, I'd like to, uh, transparently show just what my venture into the space was good, bad, or ugly. And that's not that I'm an expert by any means. It's just been what I've been learning, uh, learning forward and stumbling into and saying, Oh, probably shouldn't have done that, but I did it anyway and figured it out as I, as I go. And I think it's kind of helpful to share that. And so at some point I think it'll be good to share it here on the show. Um, anything else anyone wants to share or after the, uh, the, the three hour marks, I think we've gone plenty long. Any any closing thoughts? Thank you. Yeah, that's what comes to mind. Thank you for all the all the people watching and the ones after the fact, and appreciate all your time that you spend with us with these long form Sunday lives. Uh, shout out to MMA. Thank you so much for coming on, being our guest. So, first and foremost, yeah. Anyway. No, the pleasure's all ours. And again, I want to extend the same sentiment. Thank you to everyone that's joined us for the whole three hours live, everyone that's going to watch after the fact, and especially you guys for having us on. It's been a really fantastic opportunity to talk. Really, really enjoyed it. Thanks a ton. Any final thoughts, Banjo? No, just uh, another, you know, really appreciate having MMA on. I uh, love the perspective. I love going deep on the financial side. So it's exciting to get the um, dialogue out in the open. And I'm excited for what's to come. Fancy, any closing thoughts? Yeah, that was long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was long. And it was different. I think this is a different show than we've ever had. And we're really trying to think because normally we spend a lot of time theory crafting. But this is an, impart, an important part of, of creating a lifestyle and creating a career in this space. And there's some aspects to it that really need to be considered uh, that probably are going to weigh heavily on experience in this space and experience that personally I don't have. I'm new in, new in the space of trying to make play to earning a uh, play to earn gaming as a business and as a guild. And so leaning on those that have that have done have had have had success. I think uh, it helps me. And so as a, as a result, I'm also hoping that it helps our listening community and we appreciate you guys showing up sharing your comments your thoughts and your feedback and uh yeah each and every week that you're here we appreciate you being a part of the conversation and with that i think we're done and we will see you again this time next week and we're gonna go with our 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 recent outro which is uh has the song atlas minor with that see you next week atlas minor you were born to push the block in search of all and now it's time that you are gone so farewell atlas minor and farewell mud and pony too who's the sector same to you the pirate bastards ran him through so farewell atlas minor Promised you a diamond mine, but I'll be damned, it's hard to find. I hope there's justice for their crimes. Farewell, Atlas Miner. Farewell, friend, don't take.
take it hard Getting killed ain't all that bad Treat you well in the repair yard So farewell at 